Good afternoon. Whether you are attending virtually or in person, welcome to this meeting of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. My name is Councillor Judith Griffith and I am the committee's vice chair. However, because the committee chair, Councillor Grenville Chamberlain, cannot be here, I will be in the chair today and I've asked Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson to be vice chair of this meeting. Do members agree with that by affirmation? We agree. First, may I welcome to this meeting as guests the Chair of the Climate and Environment Advisory Committee, Councillor Pippa Haylings, who is joining remotely. The reason for this pre their presence is that her presence is that the same agenda item will be considered at a meeting of that committee immediately following on from the conclusion of this meeting. May I now make some housekeeping announcements, including important safety information for those present in person. If attending the meeting in person, we ask that where possible, you always wear a face covering. Please also keep to the one-way system in the chamber, and please use the hand sanitizer and sanitizing wipes provided. If you are in the chamber, please try to leave an empty seat between you and your neighbor. Whether present in the chamber or virtually, Please make sure that you do not switch your microphones on unless you are invited to speak. Those who are participating virtually should, be, should, if possible, use a headset and should speak slowly and clearly. Please ensure that you have switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. Only those members present in the chamber will be able to move and second motions and vote. Members present virtually may speak in the debate. Please have members who are attending virtually indicate a wish to speak by use of the chat in the Teams meeting. Those present in the council chamber should indicate their wish to speak by raising their hand. I will ask my vice chair to keep a note of the order of speakers, both virtually and in the room, giving priority to committee members. All members are, of course, welcome to speak. The role of this committee today is to review and scrutinise the decision to be taken by the executive next week and to give them our views as a committee. We are not required to vote on anything today, but I will provide feedback to the Cabinet on the views gathered at this meeting today. Those present, including any members of the public or preserving or any public speakers, are asked to note that this meeting is being filmed and live streamed. By your presence, you are deemed to have consented to be filmed and to the use of those images and sound recordings for webcast and for training purposes. May I please remind members that when speaking, they should not disclose any personal information of any individual, as this might infringe the rights of that individual and breach the Data Protection Act. In the event of the fire alarm sounding, please leave the chamber and go down the stairs to the fire door. Finally, may I, remember, may I remind members you are required to address the meeting through the chair. I shall now ask those committee members in the chamber to introduce themselves. As I said before, I am Councillor Judith Griffith and chairing today's meeting. My vice chair is Councillor Sarah Chung Johnson. Hi, I'm Sarah Chung Johnson, uh, councillor for Longstanton Ward, and not his tenure interest unless it's showing up there. Um, councillor Henry Batchelor. Afternoon, Chair. Councillor Henry Batchelor, with some feedback. One of the Linton, one of the ward members for Linton. Thank you. Councillor Anna Bradnam. Thank you, Chair. I'm Councillor Anna Bradnam, and I'm one of the district councillors for Milton and Water Beach Ward. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn. Hello, I'm Martin Kahn and I'm one of the councillors for Piston and Impington and Orchard Park Ward. Councillor Nigel Cathcart. Um. <laughs> Thank you. 
I understand that Councillor Graham Cohn um, has indicated he'll be late and I'll announce his presence when he arrives. Councillor Dr Claire Daunton. Um, thank you. Um, Claire Daunton, I'm one of the members for the Fendit and, and Fullbourne Ward. Councillor Peter Fain. Okay, I understand that he's having some technical issues and I'm sure he'll be here in a minute. Councillor Jeff Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Yes, good afternoon. Jeff Harvey, I'm the councillor for Borsham Ward. Councillor Steve Hunt. Yes, Chair, I'm Steve Hunt. I'm one of the councillors for Histon, Impington and Orchard Park. Councillor Aidan van der Veer. Uh, nothing. Yes, I'm uh, Councillor Aidan van der Waer, um, and I represent Barrington Ward. Apologies for mispronouncing your surname. Um, Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you very much, Chair. I'm Richard Williams. I'm the member for Whittlesford, Triplo, Heathfield and Newton. Um, can I check if Councillor Peter Fain has managed to join? Okay, so we'll wait a moment. Um, nonetheless, um, Ian, our Democratic Services Officer, could you introduce yourself and could you confirm, please, that the meeting is it and we can proceed? Thank you. Are there any apologies for absence, please? Are there any other apologies for absence, or is that all? Thank you. Okay, declarations of interest number three on the agenda. Do any members have interest to declare in relation to the item of business on this agenda? Obviously, apart from the fact we either live or work in or both in South Cam's district. If an interest becomes apparent later in the meeting, please would you raise it at that point so that it can be recorded in the minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, we will now deal with public questions. Questions have been received from Mr. Daniel Fulton and Mr. Phil Grant and were emailed to members yesterday. Mr. Fulton will go first, and then Mr. Grant. Okay, I would remind each speaker that they have a maximum of three minutes in which to ask their question, and may put one supplementary question, providing it arises directly out of the original question or reply, and does not exceed one minute in length. I will now invite Mr. Fulton to ask his question and for Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, Lead Cabinet Member for Planning and Policy, to respond. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, and thank you for holding the scrutiny committee today, uh, which is especially important since the last two scrutiny committees have been cancelled. Uh, today's uh, meeting is to discuss the local plan. The local plan process is premised on public participation, engagement, and public trust, which requires openness and transparency from the council. Recently, the audio feed of the council's planning committee meeting on the 8th of September was abruptly terminated just as a member of the public began to accuse the council of serious misconduct. Certainly, would num certainly one would normally assume that the occurrence of the apparent audio malfunction um, at that moment was, was a mere coincidence. However, since that time, the council has declined to provide any contemporaneous evidence about the purported audio fault, 
has declined to provide any software error codes, even any description of the software, error logs, any contemporaneous emails, or other documentation. The council has declined to provide even any basic information about the type of hardware being used for the system or the software used to operate it. If the council were to provide evidence as to the nature of the audio fault, then any concerns about impropriety could be allayed. But the council so far has declined to do so. To provide some reassurance to the public, the council please state if it has instructed any officer not to provide any evidence or information relating to the audio video system or to the events that transpired on the 8th of September to any party or to delay providing any evidence or information to any party. Thank you. I now invite Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins to respond. Thank you very much, Chair, and uh, through you, thank you for your question, uh, Mr. Fulton. But as you know, you have contacted several officers at the Council about this matter, and you have been provided with a written explanation on the 10th of September as to the underlying cause of the technical failure that occurred. You then subsequently rang and spoke directly with the external engineers last week and they provided verbal confirmation of the running order of the faults and the support that they provided. So the issue of delays or not providing information does not arise. Thank you, Chair. Now I'll ask um, Mr. Fulton, do you have a supplementary which directly relates back to that answer or your original question? Uh, yes, I do, Chair. Um, thank you very much for your response. Um, I did speak with the external engineer um, last week who confirmed that he was, quote, not comfortable that we will ever be able to get to a technical explanation of the fault that occurred. Um, that's what he said um, in the conversation. It raised a lot of red flags that he wasn't able to give any kind of answer. I do think that the council is going to have to provide further information, um, and I hope that but it Mr. does so Fulton, promptly. Thank just you. I must interrupt. Is there a question there? No, just a response. That's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I will now invite Mr. Grant to ask his question, and for Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, the Cabinet Member for Planning and Policy, to respond. Sorry, have you just got into your seat? You <laughs> ready? Okay, we'll pause for a brief moment. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. I am Phil Grant, a South Kempshire resident and a director of Axis Land Partnerships Limited. Thank you for the opportunity to address you all this afternoon. I would like to ask a question relating to the Greater Cambridge Local Plan first proposals and preferred locations for growth. The proposed direction for policy S slash DS development strategy set out in the first proposals document correctly place a significant weight on aligning new development with investments in public transport. Can you still hear me? Oh, sorry. The transport strategy on page 42 confirms our proposed strategy is heavily informed by the location of existing and committed public transport schemes. However, a comparison of figure six showing proposed sites for inclusion in the plan and figure 11, showing existing and proposed major transport projects, illustrates that the spatial strategy is disproportionately reliant on the delivery of significant levels of new, major and complex transport infrastructure projects, such as the Camborne to Cambridge C2C transport link and the East-West Rail, the provision of the latter being outside the control of the authority. 
and does not have the cert level of certainty on delivery timeframes necessary to support a robust local plan. The independent audit review of the C2C project recognised that housing developments in Camborne West and Bourne Airfield require the C2C, C2C project to be opened by 2025 to provide reliable public transport services, otherwise that planned growth will be put at risk. The committee should be aware that no proposed growth has been aligned to existing public transport routes and committed investments to the southwest of Cambridge, for example, along the A10 corridor and National Rail Network, which will benefit from the Melbourne Greenway and Foxton Travel Hub, the latter due to be operational in 2024. These projects are in the direct control of the Greater Cambridge Partnership, delivery of which would enable sustainable growth to be realised in the early part of the planned period. In the light of these facts, what does the committee think about such reliance on uncertain, complex and third party infrastructure projects to deliver significant levels of growth as opposed to aligning growth with existing and inherently sustainable public transport infrastructure? Is it a sound strategy and when in the planned period will this growth be realised? Thank you very much. Thank you, just in time. Um, Councillor Dr Toomey Hawkins, please may you respond. Um, thank you very much, Chair, and uh, through you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Grant, for uh, your question, which obviously uh, got us thinking. Um, however, um, bear with me, because it's a technical question, and my answer is just a bit more technical, shall we say. But bear with me. Our first proposals for the new plan draws on several evidence bases, including transport considerations, but also uh, there are other components of what makes a location sustainable. Um, our evidence showed that the combined benefits of the East-West Rail and Camborne to Cambridge uh, projects will make Camborne a highly sustainable location in transport terms. But in addition to transport considerations, our evidence showed that providing further development at Cambon would be a lot more sustainable than allocating a new settlement in a brand new location, given that it will grow an existing town to become larger, uh, it will enhance the existing critical mass of the population, employment and services, and it would actually speed up delivery of development in comparison to starting afresh in a new location. And also, um, in comparison with locating development close to an existing rail station, development at Camborne will provide an opportunity to design a sustainable community built around the new station. Now, if I go into terms of reliance on transport schemes, uh, to inform locations and delivery assumptions in the first proposal strategy, we took an informed view um, about the transport schemes, including the certainty and timing of delivery. We worked with partners that will be delivering uh, this infrastructure, including the combined authority, the county council, uh, Greater Cambridge Partnership, and Network Rail, of course. And the delivery assumptions that we have included in the plan draws on the information that's been provided both publicly and by these bodies, as well as being informed by the delivery rates and lead times that was identified in a housing delivery study of August 2021. Now, the key locations that we have included um, rely significantly part on the, you know, the schemes that are in direct control of the GCP, sorry, Greater Cambridge Partnership, to um, explain the acronym, um, who have an agreed delivery vehicle and have committed funding. With regard to the C2C, uh, this, as you know, has progressed since 2018 through several, several stages, refining the options, and at the last executive board meeting in July 2021, the board approved an outlined business case and asked the project team to go ahead with the next stage of the application process, 
which is to undertake a full environmental impact assessment. So that project is uh, making progress. Now, we do know that East West Wales is currently at an early stage, but it is expected um, to go through its, uh, its process um, and be delivered potentially, I think, with halfway through the plan period that we are looking at um, at the moment. So once we have given weight to it, um, we've also made clear that we will review the progress and the position of uh, East West Wales delivery at each stage of our plan making process. And the growth that we have allocated for Canbon actually is at the latter part, the other half of the um, plan period, bearing in mind uh, the timing that I have just mentioned. <coughs> so basically, in summary, um, or before I do that, Melbourne also is one of the uh, villages that we have actually allocated something in, and that is in the southwest uh, along the transport corridor that Mr. Grant uh, mentioned. So our evidence shows that our strategy is sustainable uh, when considered relative to the uh, transport issue plus other impacts. Now, obviously, we're happy to um, you know, answer further questions if uh, Mr. Grant has further questions to ask, but this, those might be technical issues that we might have to take up um, outside of this forum. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, now I need to ask you, Mr. Grant, do you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, thank you. It's just a brief one, and, and I'll try not to make it too technical. I uh, apologise if it's too technical. Um, uh, it, it, I thank you for the, for the very in-depth answer, and I appreciate uh, what you're saying. Um, it does concern me that uh, through two now two local plan periods, the last local plan, which is currently adopted, and the new local plan coming forward, both the uh, Cambridge, London, Liverpool Street line and the uh, King's Cross line have neither had a major or have been considered for major areas of growth, which serve multiple villages along the way and connect into different parts of the country. The East West Rail, as, as you acknowledge, is a long way away. And um, we have seen various central government projects, which is this reliance on fall away, including the expressway. Therefore, I would ask if there is part of me increasing the robustness of your plan and looking at the cost to the public purse, whether these existing railway stations along both the Liverpool Street line and the King's Cross line could actually deliver um, better, more robust growth um, of, of a reasonable level. Just a, a cheaper Apologies, cost. that's Sorry. the alarm to ask you to yeah. round up. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Um, Councillor Dr. Tina Higgins, a response. Um, thank you. Um, I take Mr. Grant's point, um, but the, as I said before, the, the evidence that we have worked on has been quite robust. It doesn't mean that we, we can't uh, have a look at this again, uh, bearing in mind the points that he's made. Um, but it's, it's an ongoing process, and um, we take his points on board. And of course, I've got um, the Assistant Director of Planning Policy next to me, and our um, planning policy team. And um, we can have a look at that and get back to Mr. Grant, if there's any further information to provide. Thank you. OK, thank you. Thank you to our public speakers. Before we move on to the substantive item on the agenda, I'd just like to announce that a couple of members have joined us. Um, Councillor Graham Cohn, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, my name's Councillor Graham Cohn. I'm the, um, one of the members for the Fenditton and Fallwall Ward. Thank you. I also understand that Councillor Peter Fain has managed to join us online. Could you introduce yourself too, please?
Okay, um, I gather there's a slight technical issue. Can I just see how long it's going to take? Hang on. Oh, um, Councillor Fain, you've been asked to repeat what you've just said. Apologies, everybody listening online and in the room. We need to pause for probably about five minutes whilst we sort out one of the technical issues. And I'll get back to you shortly. Okay, we're back live. That um, issue has been resolved and in the sense that anybody on the online members will type their question in to the chat and um, the vice chair will read that aloud so that everybody 
if on the live stream and in the room can hear what the question is. Okay, if we move on now to the substantive item of the Greater Cambridge Local Plan on pages 1 to 372 of your agenda packs. Um, to open this um, item, I'd like to ask Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins <laughs> um, to introduce the category as planning lead. Good evening. Thank you, Chair. Um, you have before you this evening the uh, first proposals, which is the preferred options of the emerging Greater Cambridge local plan. Um, I would first like to thank the uh, policy team who have done an exceptional amount of work uh, to get us to this stage. And um, thank you. I have here with me um, the uh, Assistant Director of Policy, Strategy and Economy. Strategy and economy. <laughs> I've got policy on the brain. Um, uh, Paul Freyner, who will uh, assist in uh, answering questions today. And I've also got Vera Van Dixon, who is on the other side, who's been um, leading the team. Um, we, we have worked and uh, built upon the uh, existing local plan that we have, or the adopted local plan. Um, but having had a look at uh, all the, um, I guess, all, all, all the uh, outcomes of the first conversation, which we had last year, we found that uh, overwhelmingly, uh, people were in favor of having uh, a plan that took account of climate change and its impact. And that meant that, of course, um, the theme, one of the themes of the plan that we have uh, is climate change. We also have biodiversity and um, green, uh, green spaces, health and well-being, um, and great places, which all go together to uh, help us identify how many jobs and homes we would need in the plan period of 2020 to 2021, uh, and the infrastructure that will go with it. So we were very mindful of that, and I think we have come up with what we think is a very green um, local plan basis. The preferred options uh, stage, we have selected um, 19 new sites, uh, proposing to um, add just over 7,000 new homes. But we have also um, allowed for 10%, which is just roughly about 4,000, just about 4,000 homes. Um, this allowance is in case some sites fall out or things don't go according to plan. Um, and so uh, what you have before you is one that rolls over uh, 37,200, I think, uh, homes from the current adopted plan and 11,200 uh, in, um, in, um, in the new plan. Um, I'm sure you have lots of questions that you want to ask us. So rather than rabbit on, I will um, hand over back to you, Chair, and uh, take the questions uh, from the committee members as they come. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, before I ask, I gather that Paul Freyner here has a presentation as well. Before we go to that, I just want to break down this huge agenda item so that we can get through at the pace of the meeting. And members on the committee, can I ask you, when you are asking the questions, to really keep them cogent and on the topic matters, and we'll take them in this order. So housing numbers, number one, and I'll let you know as we go through. Number two will be allocations. So we'll be looking at locations and jobs, et cetera. And number three will be green belt. Number four will be the environmental impact. And by that, I mean 
subjects such as climate change, active modes of transport, biodiversity, water supply, electricity supply from renewables, etc. And finally, infrastructure and its implications. I've done this to make the discussion go in a positive and um, informed direction, so it's not scattergun in its approach. Anyway, so before we start on those questions, and do jot down your questions on a piece of paper and your packs to keep them very much to the point. Thank you for that in advance. And Paul Frainer, would you like to present as well? Thank you, Chair. Just a, a matter of clarity, because obviously we've had some problems technically. We do have <laughs> some of our team on the other end of Teams who are going to share the presentation. Um, Aaron, I can share it from here, and John is going to talk through it. Would that work, or can they share the presentation? Is it just that we can't? That's, that's helpful. So if I ask them to share the presentation now, then John will walk through it, and then we'll answer any questions as best we can after that, Chair. Thanks very much. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. And uh, one other thing, when there are questions, uh, that please direct them to the planning lead, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. If there are things that she needs assistance with, <laughs> come back through me and I'll click go to you, Paul Frainer. And then if there's anyone else who needs to help answer on that from your team, please just go directly to them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm going to go through this part quickly. This is a very similar presentation that we okay, gave to you. Could you introduce our... yourself? Oh, sorry. I'm uh, John Dixon, the Planning Policy Manager. Uh, this, this is a very similar presentation to the one we gave to the uh, webinar uh, online um, three weeks ago now. And also, we also presented a similar presentation to the Joint Local Plan Advisory Group, uh, which met again uh, about 10 days ago and also considered the issues through that joint forum. Um, the consultation that we're proposing really builds on the first conversation uh, that we undertook back in 2020. And since that time, we've carried out an awful lot of research and options testing and further engagement with uh, stakeholders. You'll recall we published a lot of evidence back in November uh, and had a series of workshops. And all that has led to the point we're at now. Um, the consultation uh, includes uh, a guiding vision, which we think tries to capture what the plan is uh, aiming to achieve in a nutshell, I guess. And all this obviously will be up for, for consultation when we start uh, proposed consultation in November. Uh, that's supported by a series of objectives. Now you may recognize that those objectives are very much um, structured around the big themes that we consulted on uh, back at the first conversation and we continue those themes uh, through this process. Looking at our objectively assessed needs, uh, the plan needs to respond to the needs and plan for them. Um, a lot of work has gone into looking at what those needs should actually be, um, in particular an evidence based looking at what's happened uh, in our economy and what's expected to happen in the future. And drawing all that information together, uh, the evidence base suggests that um, that level of jobs growth at 58,000 is the most likely outcome in terms of jobs that would happen up to 2041. And therefore, the evidence indicates that we should be planning for a higher level of homes uh, than the standard method in order to respond to the jobs that are likely to be happening in the area, because that is the most sustainable approach available. What that means in terms of the overall number of homes uh, this slide really tries to capture that. Uh, we, we have an awful lot of homes still to meet that need in the pipeline. So we already have 37,200 homes on site uh, coming forward with planning permission or allocated in the last local plan. Looking at that evidence of need, we need to identify then a further 7,200 homes to respond 
the additional need to 2041, plus the 10% buffer, which is really about making sure we have enough sites with some flexibility to make sure we deliver those numbers. Then, clear, a lot of work has gone into looking at the strategy that should be undertaken. So where should those homes, jobs, and infrastructure be located? And we touched on that in the public questions earlier. We've looked at a range of key issues. So carbon, emissions, and climate change has been a key influence on the strategy. Um, it's really led us to focus on those brownfield opportunities on the edge of Cambridge, where you have that benefit of proximity and also sites which can take advantage of the uh, transport infrastructure that is being planned or coming forward in the area already. Green infrastructure is also key. It's not just about built development, and you'll see in the proposed consultation material, we have the green infrastructure theme and proposals regarding what investment and which areas would benefit from green infrastructure investment support development. We're also very keenly aware of the challenges regarding water supply and we've made very clear that there is an ongoing process from um, at the regional level from water providers looking at that water issue and we still need to understand the outcome of that process to confirm there is sustainable water supplies available um, to support the strategy that's been identified. The next slide really looks at where the homes are proposed and again this slide tries to capture that we do have a lot of homes in the pipeline at sites on the edge of Cambridge, released through the previous plan making and those new settlements, the last round of plan making. And the additional sites that we've proposed primarily focus on um, the Cambridge East Airport site, Northeast Cambridge, where we're preparing an air action plan, and then um, broad location at Camborne. Uh, that would reflect the um, arrival of a new railway station in association with East Rift Rail. And the slide shows uh, the distribution of that growth um, across the area. We've then got uh, a map showing, as I mentioned earlier, the green infrastructure proposals. Uh, you may recall back at the first conversation, we asked questions about where we should be prioritizing green infrastructure and carried out uh, an opportunities mapping exercise and got a lot of feedback uh, from the community. And this is the outcome of those consultations, providing uh, details of where we think green infrastructure investments should be focused in the future. All this, of course, will be part of the consultation going forward. Uh, the next set of slides really go through where the allocations specifically have been uh, proposed in the plan. I won't go through all of these given given time constraints, uh, but you can see there's a range of sites uh, proposed within the city of Cambridge itself, but also opportunity areas which would look to um, shape developments that will come forward during the plan period and some of those key Cambridge areas um, such as um, around the Grafton Centre um, where you get a lot of change happening over the period in the consultation material. Um, there are some large developments then proposed on the edge of Cambridge. We've got existing developments at Darwin Green and Northwest Cambridge, where we think there might be even increased opportunities for growth as part of this plan. And then the airport proposals, which deliver a substantial new urban core to the city, um, as, as Marshall's intent to relocate off the site. And we've also looked again at the southern fringe of Cambridge and looking at uh, how we can support uh, the future needs of the very important biomedical campus, but also balancing that uh, with the importance of the green belt landscape and other issues in that location. Uh, looking further out from Cambridge, the existing new settlements clearly form an important part of our strategy going forward. They will deliver a significant element of the strategy over the plan period we're talking about. And then clearly, Camborne, once it gains a railway station, it will provide an opportunity for further growth and to make Camborne an even more sustainable location, uh, taking advantage of the, the considerable improvements to transport plans in the area. 
Now, this one is slightly different in the fact that it's a broad location. We don't yet have a confirmed location for the station, and that is an important issue when deciding where growth would happen in this area. So it doesn't identify a specific site at this point. We will be seeking views on the role of Camborne as broad location and how it might come forward in the future. Uh, we also then identified through the testing of many options that what we called the rural southern cluster was an important element for strategy. And we looked at development opportunities in this corridor. There are some existing allocations there at Sawston. Uh, additional proposals have been identified at uh, Grey Shelford. Actually, the genome campus already has a uh, planning permission for a significant development there. Sorry, I missed one. We also go on to close at Dugsford. And the Babram campus, the proposal there is to um, remove the existing developed area of the campus from the green belt to facilitate uh, future growth of that site so it can enable and adapt to the uh, future needs of the campus. And then in the rest of the rural area, we've identified a number of allocations, which I won't go through in detail, but the strategy really has focused on those key locations which are available and can be supported by transport. That's why the additional rural growth, in addition to what we've already got committed, uh, is, is a substantial element of the strategy. We're really trying to focus on those most sustainable locations driven by, I think a lot, that carbon narrative. The plan isn't just about allocations and sites. It's also setting the policy framework for future development of the area and planning applications which will follow. Again, structure around the big themes. We've set very ambitious policy aspirations regarding um, net zero carbon. Effectively, the policy proposals would require buildings to meet their own energy requirements on site, and if they couldn't, make contributions to uh, off site energy provision. We've also proposed a range of other policies responding to other aspects of carbon informed by our net zero carbon study, which accompanies the plan. In terms of green infrastructure, as well as the uh, green infrastructure uh, map and proposals I've spoken earlier, um, we do have a policy on biodiversity net gain, and the policy proposal is to seek 20% net gain, which is above the 10% uh, national requirement which is emerging, reflecting um, the importance of the issue in this area. On our wellbeing and social inclusion theme, we've proposed to make health uh, a running theme through the plan and require very clear um, health um, assessments to be carried out on applications. We look at how we can make our new communities um, sustainable and, and effective be communities from the outset, which includes supporting meanwhile uses. So you can have facilities on site at the early stages of those uh, sites rather than waiting for them to come forward um, as, as settlements grow. We're also looking at how we can uh, make developments provide inclusive employment opportunities. So could there be ways of supporting um, training and, uh, and opportunities for the local community to access employment generated by those sites, uh, both in construction and uh, when they're operating? The Great Places theme is really our design chapter. And we've tried to capture what, what we think uh, great places look like in Greater Cambridge to provide the opportunity to comment on those before the policies are formally developed. And we've looked again at how we can um, help our heritage assets to adapt to climate changes. There are more we can do to support those, those changes. Uh, in the jobs chapter, a lot of the policies might be fairly familiar, but there are, are some new areas. For example, should our large employment areas include elements of affordable workspace? And how can we support creative industries? What can we do to help our centres adapt to the changing retail environment? And how can we help Cambridge and other locations um, respond to the visitor pressures, for example, um, Airbnb and those issues that arise? In terms of our homes, the policies would continue to seek high levels of affordable housing. One of the issues we need to come back to is looking at the needs of gypsies and travellers. Uh, this evidence was particularly affected by um, issues surrounding uh, COVID because we were unable to go out and do the face-to-face -face surveys uh, we need to 
create that evidence, that work is now underway in this consultation already. And then uh, on infrastructure, um, we think we've proposed uh, a strong policy framework for making sure developments are well connected and sustainable. We think we should be asking uh, for developments to provide uh, charging points uh, to make sure we can respond to the changing vehicle fleet. A look at how our energy infrastructure is provided, building on the work currently going on North East Cambridge with an energy infrastructure master plan. And in digital infrastructure, become really important in everyone's day-to-day -day lives. We look to build on the policy in the current plan by uh, creating even stronger requirements for developments to be well connected. And then finally, I think we've got a slide just picking up the recommendation the cabinet will be looking at, uh, which really asks to uh, obviously approve the consultation going forward and a lot of the material to support that consultation. Uh, thank you, Chair. <coughs> okay, um, so housing numbers. We have a first question from Councillor Dr. Claire Thornton. Thank you, Chairman. Um, on page 42 of our agenda, 22 in the, um, the local plan document, um, the figure four, the illustrative map showing locations of proposed new development. Um, could you please, um, uh, um, Councillor Hawkins, um, unpick um, the difference between delivery rates and densification because both are shown in blue and the two are quite different things. Councillor Dr. Stephen Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, this, this issue has uh, you know, been picked on before and I think we will be making a change to the colour scheme. Um, but to answer the question, um, densification is the process where uh, you are building more houses on the same space. Um, and that is what is going to be happening in Eddington. And that is because the, the landowners have assured us that they are able to deliver, uh, build more on the space that they currently have that's been allocated. Uh, the difference with uh, Water Beach and North Stowe is that there is no densification in Water Beach nor North Stowe. The plan for that is to have the houses built faster within the uh, plan period. So instead of building 250 houses per annum, which is what uh, developers tend to tell us that they can do, we are saying that they should be delivering 300 homes per annum, starting, uh, well, I think it's the mid-2020s. I might be right on that one, yes. Um, and that means we'll be building more within the plan period and less after that. So that is the difference on North Stowe and Water Beach. It's not additional. It's just bringing things forward quicker. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? Thank you. That's answered. Um, and next we have Councillor Aidan van der Weyer. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, I, I have two questions, one of which um, is on the same subject as, as um, Councillor Thornton's question. Um, uh, because I, I, that, that the, the map in particular on, on page 42, figure 4, is, has, is confusing and has caused confusion in some consternation. Uh, I, could, could, could I ask specifically uh, that this, this map is not used uh, in, the, in the consultation um, uh, and another way of presenting this information is, is found and, if possible, uh, we, we stop using it at all in, in presentations um, uh, and, and uh, public, public materials. Um, uh, my uh, second question um, uh, relates to um, the, 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 the numbers and the locations, in particular between South Downs and, and the city. Um, this is a, a joint plan. Uh, it is very clearly set out as a joint plan with Cambridge um, as in South Cam, Cambridge City and South Cams, uh, which is quite right, um, uh, with functional um, economic area, functional hou um, single housing market in, in, in most respects. Um, and uh, we should be approaching the, the development of these policies uh, um, jointly, uh, with, um, um, choosing the strategies regardless of the um, uh, council that they, they, they affect. Um, 
However, I, it is quite important for people in South Thames, and I would imagine putting my shoes in the people um, of Cambridge uh, likewise, um, to know uh, uh, um, how, how it affects the, the district they live in. And it's also, I think, important to us as uh, representatives um, of, of South Thames uh, District Council. Um, and um, some, some of the, um, obviously, the, the, the history of, of development in this area meant that sort of in the past five years ago there was much more construction going on in, in Cambridge City than in South Thames, or you know, and, and that, that's sort of largely reversed because of the way that fringe sites were built out. Um, but um, so we need to find a way of, of talking about this, this balance between the city and South Thames in a way that, that, that's fair and representative of what's actually happening. So rather than just saying there's this many houses in the city and there's this many houses in South Thames, um, I, I, the, 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 my suggestion on that would be um, around the, the, the fringe sites, which are joined. Um, uh, in some of the material, uh, they've been they've, some of the fringe sites are described as fringe sites and some of them as urban sites when they are um, fringe sites in the sense that they're shared. Um, uh, so, again, if, if, if we're considering the fringe sites as shared, then it'd be useful to know what's shared, what's in the city, and what's in, in um, uh, South Thames. Um, not not so as a fundamental now, part of please. the plan. So not a, yeah, not a fund, fundamental part of the plan, but as just supplementary information. Thank you. Dr. Hawkins. Uh, thank you. Um, on the first question, uh, yeah, question, yes, we will stop using this map. We already have it um, in, in our documentation, but for the uh, consultation, we will be changing the color scheme. Um, I can assure you of that. Um, on the issue of uh, the, 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 I guess it's the, the shared sites between South Cams and, and the city. Now, as you rightly pointed out, Councillor Van der Weyer, this is a joint plan. Um, we have looked at um, needs and jobs and assessed those across both areas. We're looking at the areas as one. Um, we have in the past, um, and we still do have a number of sites that straddle both local authority areas. And that's one of the reasons why I think the, the um, inspector at the last uh, local plan examination actually you know, um, encouraged us to create a joint plan because trying to you know, decipher this is what South Cams will do or this is what the city will do or need or have um, was getting more complicated. So um, we have a plan here that looks across the piece. It, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter where, uh, you know, how many is in the city or how many is in South Cams, because I know that um, those who live in both areas obviously would like to know. But my emphasis is on the fact that we are looking at this jointly. Um, and we should be talking about the numbers jointly, not this is what is in South Cams and this is what is in the city. Um, I think one, one thing to point out is that within South Cams itself, the villages have been protected mostly because we only have 384 uh, homes proposed in five uh, rural villages. Okay, so, um, you know, that stands out in itself because we're not dispersing um, um, uh, development, but trying to concentrate it where it's most sustainable. I hope thank that answers you. your question, Councillor Van der Waal. Um, through the chair, thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have a follow-up? Okay. Um, next, um, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, just before I start, I've actually got quite a number of questions. Um, so I don't know whether you prefer me to ask some and then let other members go. Can you just sort of try me. and, because of the time factor, <laughs> we've got a yeah, follow-on meeting. They are, Can they you are, um, yeah. emphasise the housing number one first and just yeah. keep it to one? Get it into one question. I can't possibly scrutinise okay. this without on Go quickly. one question. Go quickly. I'm sorry, Chair. Um, I just can't. And I think it's important that we are allowed to scrutinise. But I'm more than happy to ask some and then pause for other members and come back. How many have you got? Six. Can you ask them very succinctly and we'll. I will get do going. my best. Okay, so first question uh, Do you accept the uncertainty inherent in employment estimates um, and predicting future growth 
on the basis of that, or rather do you accept the uncertainty inherent in employment estimates and therefore that predicting future growth is in large part a matter of judgment if you're going to predict uh, growth on the basis of employment estimates. I would cite, uh, I, I think you've already heard it before, but para 9.11 of the Employment and Land Review, estimating employment is intrinsically difficult and it is arguably becoming even harder. There is no um, unambiguously right answer, 9.15. It is clearly difficult to agree exactly how much employment growth Greater Cambridge has seen in the recent past. I cite that because, of course, the housing number is derived directly from projections on the basis of employment, which the report itself acknowledges um, are highly um, uncertain. Would you accept as my second question that the... Sorry, Dr. Richard Williams, that is... Yes, quite a long question, so we're going to have to take the one question at the moment and then let other people have a go, and then I will have to see how long it takes. Thank you. Um, Council Dr. Jimmy Hawkins, would you like to answer the first one? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I wish everything was certain in life, but it's not the case. Um, yes, there is a level of uncertainty um, in predictions. That's why they're predictions. But what we have done is to um, get as much evidence as we possibly could um, on what we expect growth to be. Uh, and some of this is based on what we have seen happen over the last few years. This area is growing and is growing quite quickly. We have also had the benefit of the uh, Spears report. Uh, yeah. Cambridge. Cambridge and Peterborough Economic, Economic Review. Review. Thank you. We've had that report, which showed us that the growth in the greater Cambridge area has been quite significant, more significant than had previously been predicted. And if we were to carry on in the way that um, it is going, definitely uh, the numbers that we have predicted seem to be the reasonable approach. We agree there's uncertainty, but we need to make sure that whatever it is that we put before an inspector, we can justify. And we can do that with the numbers we've come up with, with the evidence that we have. Thank you. Thank you. I will go down the list and we'll come back to you if there is sufficient time. Okay. Okay. Doctor, sorry, not Doctor, <laughs> Councillor Anna Bradnam. Thank you for the introduction, Anne. Um, my question takes us back to uh, the point that Councillor Daunton made about the uh, bringing forward the delivery of housing at Water Beach New Town. And I just wanted to um, remind those preparing the plan that the approval for Water Beach New Town Phase 1 is contingent upon a trip budget uh, for maximum numbers of vehicles to be added to the A10, i.e. not very many. And so any subsequent phase of Water Beach New Town also needs to be, is, will be contingent upon the, that same trip budget for the A10. So reference to that. Um, that there is a, a need to balance those two requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Um, yes, we, we take on board the fact that by bringing forward um, delivery, we would have to make sure there's a, 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 a refreshing of the um, uh, looking at the trip budget alongside that, because that you might end up obviously with bringing things forward means you reach that trip budget quicker. <laughs> so we will be looking at working with our highways um, colleagues to make sure that we don't um, exceed that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bradman, does that answer your question? Thank you, yes it does. Yeah, thank you. Um, and next, Councillor Cathcart. Thank you. I've just got only one question. Um, yeah. uh, the, uh, uh, just the relationship between the uh, the, the, the anticipated number of houses, which would be 7,200, and the buffer. Uh, the buffer is actually quite a high proportion of the total um, number of houses, about 60%. And a buffer, to my mind, is something as a contingency. 
something you want to keep in reserve in case you need it. However, when you look at the way the plan is crafted and the way that the sites, and we've identified specific sites to cope for not only the anticipated 7,300, but also the buffer, bring up to 11,000, we've actually already uh, anticipated we will need that buffer because of the way we've allocated the sites. Um, uh, whereas a buffer, uh, what I'm really saying is you may find at the end of the day uh, you don't need the buffer because all the, how, all the sites and all the houses you've identified will come to fruition as you anticipate. Therefore, there may be a risk of actually providing more sites than you need by actually assuming that the buffer will be required. You see what I'm saying? That's a good question. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Um, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, can you turn your mic off, please? Oh, sorry. Right. Um, yes, I do see what you're saying. But the 10%, um, if you look at that, is the 10% of the overall figure, not the 10% of the 7,200. And what that means is, we're still saying that, yes, there might be a risk um, that some of the sites in the current plan themselves might not deliver, which is why we need to look at it in the round. Okay? But bear in mind that all of this isn't going to be delivered within the plan period. It's still, many, of, many of this will be further down the line. So there's an opportunity further down the line to actually also revise what we, what we provide. Objecting to a buffer as such, yeah. I think, is a useful thing to have. Yeah. It's just that the, you know, we need to bear in mind that it, it may not be required in its totality. It may not. We don't know that, but we need to be. Might need. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, supplementary or your question answered, Councillor yeah. Cathcart. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Chung Johnson. Hi, um, I'm asking these questions partly as the member for a ward which is building out the biggest new town. So obviously sensitivity around new settlements, uh, we're kind of already experiencing. So I'm hoping that some of what I've had to say is uh, experience sharing for future uh, stages that Water Beach and Bourne Airfield and other sites will, will see. So just reiterating, um, we've already made the points on the maps, but just to ensure it's not just a colour scheme that needs to change on, this is page 46 and page 60, figures four on page 46 and page 60, figure nine, but it's also the numbers. So there's com some confusion, sorry, that North Stone numbers looked like they were increasing. I think we need to make it crystal clear. We were not increasing numbers in North Stowe. You're just talking about increased build out rates. So we in this room know the details more, we're more aware, but I think when you go out to consultation, just make it really clear because it did cause a panic. Um, also, in, also uh, in addition, um, I understand, uh, Councillor Dr Hawkins, the, the point you're making about it being a joint plan, but I think there is some consternation from residents feeling that South Cams are taking the brunt of the additional growth. So during the consultation process, you may be asked specifically, how many houses is Cambridge City building? And do we have an answer to that? And do we have a justification for that that we're ready for? Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, please respond. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, this, this map, this map and the colour scheme, we will get it right for the consultation, promise. Um, on the second issue, I think it's, it is unfortunate that we have had some people who have been scaremongering. Um, and what we will try and make sure we do is to have the uh, the information that we need to answer that sort of question. But I must emphasize, this is a joint plan. And the moment we start breaking it down into cities taking this and South Camps is taking that, we, we will find ourselves, you know, just going around in circles, frankly, and causing consternation where there really shouldn't be. We need to look at this as a joint plan. Otherwise, why are we doing it? Okay, any follow-up? No, no, okay. 
Councillor Cohn. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, just two quick um, questions. Um, the first was on um, uh, housing numbers in terms of the equation that's being used and how much does that sort of factor the pandemic? I know that's difficult with an emerging uh, local plan to factor that into you know, emerging equations, but how much has that been factored in terms of uh, growth housing numbers and sort of commercial development? The, the second one, I think, is, is linked to housing numbers, but um, it's a question on uh, neighbourhood plans. So on page 265 of, of our pack and, and the um, information is the same number, um, we, we talk about um, the need to encourage neighbourhood plans to sort of allocate uh, sites or, or additional sort of housing numbers, essentially, within those neighbourhood plans, um, which you know, I think is a, a good thing and should be in the policy. Um, but I just wondered if, if the policy in here had enough bite in terms of um, where that would be applicable and how much influence the neighbourhood plan would have over exception sites. Because it talks about the local plan and the neighbourhood plan essentially sort of um, being overridden for exception sites, but gives then detail on uh, why that would be the case. But um, where it talks about rural, ex rural exception sites will be, will be allowed in Greenbelt only when it can be demonstrated that non-Greenbelt alternative sites um, are not available. Um, I just was sort of wondered who's demonstrating that, who's sort of involved in, in that. So I wondered if that could be um, padded out in, within that policy. But that, that's all. Thank you. Dr. Kim Hawkins, to respond, please. Yes, thank you. Um, let me take the, the last one first. Now, you will be aware, I think, uh, Councillor Kuhn, that we have uh, in South Cam, some villages that are completely entirely within the Green Belt. <laughs> so um, if they wanted affordable housing or exception sites, it would logically be in the Green Belt. And in fact, um, I do know of a couple of such villages who had made a request um, for affordable housing um, to be allocated within the local plan for them, or rather, you know, on exception sites, but you can't do that. <laughs> within the local plan. If you were to allocate a site within the local plan, it's going to be out there, not an exception site. It's exception because it's not in the local plan. That's the difference. Um, so in that case, it's easily demonstrable. However, I'm sure there are ways in which we can demonstrate that there aren't any other sites um, available, um, you know, if it was not completely entirely within the green bill. But I, I can't see that. Unless it's, a, it's, unless it's a village that is on the edge of the green belt and the potential site is within the green belt. But you will, we can demonstrate, I'm sure, um, when it comes to exception sites. I mean, it, this has been going on for a while. We know how to do this and um, we'll be able to demonstrate it. In terms of, uh, it was two questions, wasn't it? Was it? Yes, uh, impact of COVID. I think we're all still finding out what the impact of COVID is. And um, the, in an area like ours where we have seen that even during the pandemic, um, once we went out of the first lockdown, um, business kind of restarted. Um, a lot of uh, research work can't be done at home. <laughs> And there's a lot of that that goes on in this area. Um, but we are mindful that uh, the need for office space might be different, but the need for research space might not. I'll give you an example. Um, Bourne Quarter, which is on Bonnie Airfield, which is next to my village, um, is a completely, uh, the Bourne Quarter itself is an employment site. It was an employment site, still is an employment site. And the developers, when they started to build it, uh, came up with phase one and said phase two and phase three, we will do that further down the line. 
they are now coming in for a prayer for phase two, potentially, uh, because they have found the take up of their phase one side has been quite high. That in itself is an indication that there is growth still happening, uh, probably even faster than we think it is happening. So um, we will have to be very careful, obviously, as we carry on with the plan to make sure that uh, whatever evidence there is, we can gather it and we can use it um, in determining, I guess, the final figures that we will require for um, employment space. Thank you. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Curry? No, Chair, I think that sort of um, was getting at the question I was asking. With the, with the neighbourhood um, plans, essentially what I was sort of getting at was um, uh, both the local and neighbourhood plans. I was just worried that the policy didn't imply that they could be sort of overridden, if you like. I know exception sites are exceptional to what is already in the local plan, but if you had a neighbourhood plan that was allocating, you know, local housing need, and there was an exception site that wasn't within that neighbourhood plan um, that came forward. Um, I was just sort of making sure the wording didn't imply that that could be overridden as well, essentially. But I think you've answered that in, yeah, yeah. In. OK. Um, yeah, just very quickly. You. Quickly. Thank you. Um, neighbourhood plans have to be in line with the local plan. The neighbourhood plan cannot override the local plan. Right. Um, and if a neighborhood plan is um, wanting to include something that's an exception site, obviously you know, we, we have officers who work with the group, with the community to bring forward their neighborhood plan, um, but it will definitely be in line with the local plan. But the exception, as I rightly said before, will be outside of what's in the plan. Okay. It doesn't override the local plan. Okay. We, we clear? Yeah, thank you. All right. um, can we move on now to Councillor Dr. Martin Kahn? Uh, when you uh, me 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 measure the numbers, you basically you were based upon employment. But historically, since the war, uh, much of the increase in housing has been due to redu reduction in house size. How's has size been taken into account in the estimates at all? How has it been taken into the estimates? It has quite an implication and a number of factors, for instance, in terms of the type of housing you're providing um, and in terms of the, um, sorry, the, the house, type of housing you're providing and in terms of the, um, uh, uh, you've got to do with HMOs. Uh, if, you may want to decide that if you're having a problem with the, Numbers, you may need more small houses, you may need to increase the controls, for instance, by withdrawing using an Article 4 direction to withdraw rights down to three, like a number of London boroughs have done. Uh, uh, so it might have an effect on small villages where you have a, quite a, a wave, I think, in villages of any small house being increased by a larger house by building extensions so that the number of small houses, small size houses, is reduced. These are factors which depend upon household size and predictions uh, uh, and your policies. How, how much has that been taken into account? So, Dr. Timmy Hawkins, again, please respond. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think I will pass this one on to <laughs> Jonathan Dixon. Thank you. So, one of the uh, evidence studies um, we have prepared and is available to you is a study looking at effectively those, those housing needs. So, it translates the number of people, the number of job centres needing to come to the area or uh, needing homes. Uh, looking at what sort of homes they're needed, um, household size issues, and so on. So there's a, a complex evidence base looking at those issues, not just from the employment, but also the housing needs, the population growth element as well. So those issues very much have been part of it. And the housing mix uh, that we need will also inform what we need to plan for on site, and that's very much captured in the housing uh, theme of the, the plan as well. So, yeah, important issue that has been looked at in detail. Do you have a supplementary or is your question answered? Okay, um, we have um, Councillor Sue Ellington, who does not sit on the committee, but I can take a question. Then we will turn back to um, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams if your questions have not already been answered. And then after that, I would like to move on to more on to the allocations and Greenbelt. 
Thank you for indulging me. Um, you say that most of these houses are going to be in large sites like North Star and Camborne and so on and not affecting our villages. But you've also put a substantial number of homes which are going to be windfall sites. And I just wondered whether there is a criteria about how large a windfall can be. Because, you know, some, some rather large gardens can, can manage 30 houses quite comfortably. And it just can have a dynamic effect on relatively small villages when you get an a, a influx of new people, as I know. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ellington, for your question. Um, I would like to think that when a windfall site does come up, we look at it within the context of the policy for the hierarchy of that village. And um, there would have to be exceptional circumstances, I would imagine, for us to deviate from that. So, um, you know, we have limits of, um, I think, good villages, it's eight. Um, and 15, if it's a site to be reused, I mean, it got 30 for rural and minor rural. So we will be following that uh, criteria as strictly as we possibly can. <laughs> Hope that assures you. Councillor Ellington, do you have a follow up? Thank you. Um, OK, back to Councillor Dr Richard Williams. I hope some of your questions may have been answered. Um, Far away with the next one. One was Councillor Ellington just asked one of my questions. Excellent. So there we are. Okay. We're, we're making progress. Skip on. Uh, we're making progress. Um, I, I, just coming back to this city and um, South Cam's issue, I've got, I've got two questions, so I'll try and try and elide them into one. Um, I mean, just on, on the question Councillor John Johnson asked, those figures are actually in the key documents. They're in the key facts document we were given. 14,022 houses in city, 34,772 um, in South Camps. That's not scaremongering, that's in the council's own documents. And, you know, the facts may be scary, but they are the facts. Um, anyway, so those um, key facts, those figures that, that are given by the council in the key facts document, they equate to an annualised need for 668 houses per year in the city over the plan period. For South Camps, the annualised number of houses needed per year is 1,656. Now, the number of houses required in that plan, on that basis, um, is actually very similar to the standard method. The standard method number for Cambridge in December 2020, House of Commons Library Research, is 662. We're proposing 668. It's virtually exactly the same. The difference for South Camps, though, is huge. The uh, standard method calculation, uh, again, uh, same source, in December is 1,083 houses in South Camps per year, annualised over the course of the plan. We're proposing 1,656. It's 53% um, more. But, and this, kind of, this comes to the nub of my question, okay? In the Housing and Employment Relationship Report, which translates the employment figure you want to aim for into housing need, in Table 23 of that document, on a one-to-one -one commuting ratio, applying that to City and South Cams, that document says that there is a need on our own calculations, on your own methodology, for 990 houses in City per year and 1,120 in South Cams. So one of my questions, not the last one, one of my questions is how did those figures in a calculated need on your method in that housing report become very different figures where all of the extra housing is loaded onto South Cams and none of it is loaded onto City. How did that happen? Okay, Councillor Dr Williams, could you turn off your mic, please? Um, Councillor Dr Timmy Hawkins, please respond. Uh, thank you, Chair. I probably would like to take this in two parts. Um, Dr. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams quoted 14,400 and 34,500 figures for South Cams and the city. Those are in the current adopted local plans. They were created separately. We have figures. Would you let me finish? The answer, thank you. We have substantial numbers already in the current adopted local plans. That is a fact. 
and those are being carried forward into the emerging local plan. That is a fact too. They're not new, they're in what is already in the pipeline. In terms of... Please can you let the lead member for planning respond and then you'll have a chance for a follow up. Please listen, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, you have raised some very, uh, I guess it's a very technical, detailed question which I don't have the um, answer to, but I will ask um, the officers to please um, provide some answers to that second part of the question. Would that be as a written response, or do you have the answers on you now? Paul Kramer. We can provide a written response. Yeah, so I think we should provide a written response to that. I believe it's a similar question to what was asked in our LPAG question. I think we've got some further detail on that because obviously, as you understand, it is quite a complex piece of economic modelling. I think the difficulty is being able to explain it in a situation that, um, that provides you with all the detail that you're looking for. Um, so written response to that question. Um, I think if it's very, very detailed, that's probably the most accurate and detailed way to get to the right answer. Um, do you have one final one which you could encapsulate? Well, there are two further questions, Chair, I, I want to ask. And I, I don't want to be difficult, but I would press the point. This is a local plan. Yeah, go, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. Go. Okay. Um, okay, so j just, just on that point, and again, maybe a written answer would be, would, would, would be useful for this one as well. But this is a question about the economic modelling uh, of employment. And again, the different impact that that modelling has on the city and on South Cams. So this model that's been developed with those extra employment projections in those three areas. Now, if you compare that to the East of England economic forecast model, the difference between the employment growth figure you come out with for city um, on the EEFM model and on the bespoke model you've got, it's actually very small. Um, the EEFM growth um, figures, you know, this is backward looking, 2011, 2017, it's 2.8% in EEFM, it's 3% with the model you've derived. Um, so it, there's not much of a difference. But again, you see with South Cams, actually a huge difference. Is the EEFM figure for South Cams is 1.5%, but the figure for your model is 3.4. It's more than double. Um, and then if you project that forward, again, we can see the same thing. So EEFM projects 1.1% growth in South Cams employment over the period. Uh, your model projects 1.2, very similar. Look at South Cams, EEFM predicts 0.5% annualized employment growth. Your model predicts 1.1%. So again, it's more than double. So in as much as you're making the argument that the EEFM model is inapplicable to, to Greater Cambridge, I would actually argue that it's inapplicable to South Cams. It's not inapplicable to Cambridge. It works pretty much the same as your model. Um, which again goes back to this point about the way that the methodology that's been chosen is one way or another loading growth on South Cams. In this case, forcing employment growth in South Cams up to the level of city, effectively. Um, and that's the, the, the key, really, effect of that model um, that you choose. So um, I, I would like some explanation, really, or, or, or some more explanation as to why this model you've developed has such a different effect in South Cams to what it has in the city. Um, Councillor Dr Richard Williams, have you got one final one as well? Is that a shorter one? Uh, Should we take it at the same time? Yeah, okay, I'll make it a very short one. And this one is Go just ahead. an overall question, just about the, the final choice on the medium growth. The sustainability appraisal that we have says minimum growth scenario, which is the standard method, tends to have fewer negative effects uh, than the other methods. It talks about the high growth scenario, which has been rejected as unsustainable, as having positive effects. And it talks about the medium growth as lying somewhere between the two. And if I was being uncharitable, you could say it has more negative effects and fewer positive effects. It looks like the worst of both worlds. Um, but the sustainability report, it tells us that the medium scenario is worse in terms of local services, strain on local services. It's worse in terms of uh, conserving and enhancing habitats. It's worse in terms of enhancing the character and distinctiveness of South Cams. It's worse on the historic environment. It's worse on water, as we know. But the sustainability report also says it will make no difference um, in terms of sustainable growth. 
and it will make no difference in terms of maintaining and enhancing employment. So I'm a bit confused on the sustainability proposal as to why the medium growth scenario has been chosen, given that what that report said, that it would be worse for quite a number of areas, it will make no difference economically, um, yet we seem to have chosen that one. It, 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 it's a bit inexplicable. So, so some more information on that would be helpful too. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Timmy Hawkins, um, please go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I will. Oh, I will. I will defer to uh, Mr. Freyner uh, further down the line. But just to uh, perhaps remind us that when the devolution deal was signed, um, it was predicated on growth in this region. And the mayor uh, at the time was, I think his policy was to double GVA, um, which means the, uh, you know, there was going to have to be a lot of growth. And also, uh, please bear in mind, we are within the Oxcam arc, and the, um, the government's agenda is to encourage and facilitate the growth within the arc. And let's not forget, we also have the Spears report, which I uh, referred to earlier on, again, which shows that the growth that we have actually experienced was way above what was previously predicted. So you could say predictions, we talked about that earlier on, uh, there's an inherent uh, risk in that <laughs> and uncertainty. Um, but what we have to do is make sure that we do the best we can to, um, to take account of what we think will be uh, the growth based on what we have experienced, not on what the previous model um, is talking about. Um, perhaps I will come back, but perhaps I can ask uh, Mr. Freyner to add to um, the response. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. Um, and yeah, we note your points, Councillor Williams, and I think the one thing to state is that it would be helpful to get a full, detailed kind of picture of your exact kind of questions that we can answer properly in response and the technical detail, and I'll do my best to add a little bit of meat around the bones now. I think in terms of the EEFM model that you describe, it doesn't necessarily deal particularly well with the sectors that we have in this area, and that's why we've you know, had a separate piece of economic modelling done. And I think the SPEAR report, which Councillor Hawkins referred to, which is a significant key piece of evidence for this area, which is commissioned by the Cambridge and Peter uh, Combined Authority back in 2017, states some very different figures as well. I think it's important to remember that we have to demonstrate a robust evidence base at examination. Um, and that's the point of making a local plan and to underplay our need in this area would not be correct and not be reflective of what we would need to do. And also it would be challenged at examination in the public. So we need to be very clear that once we've established that need, which we have done our own economic work on, that that is our established need. Um, my colleague John may be able to help a little bit further with the sustainability appraisal. But as we have established a need, we need to work to that need. And the sustainability appraisal is there as a sense check to kind of pick up on all of the points of sustainability that we need to address in meeting that need, and there are options for us to take that further down the line. So, John, did you want to come in on the sustainability appraisal part? Uh, absolutely. Um, the essay is an important document, but it's one element of our significant evidence base. It, really, it did explore back in November and part of this process as well, different choices available to the plan, both in terms of our levels of development and our locations of that development. And it did highlight differences um, across scenarios, across growth levels. Uh, I think on some of the, the numbers you've talked about, clearly um, both the meet, uh, the, the standard method, the low and the medium would both have significant effects on delivery of housing jobs. They would still have significant effect. But ultimately, it comes down to the level of need identified as to what the objectively assessed need is. And clearly, that's come about through a significant evidence base that's informing 
uh, the plan, will does the sustainability uh, appraisal indicate that some of the impacts um, of higher levels of growth uh, might be higher? Yes. It also identifies uncertainty around those impacts because it comes down to then how we plan on a site-specific basis and clearly moving the plan forward from those testing board options, what we're going to do is move from those uncertainties through to having greater certainty where we can look at those impacts and how they can be mitigated and use that as a tool to inform that process. Thank you. Um, so, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, you will be receiving detailed responses, in written responses, because they are very detailed questions. Thank you. Okay, we have got a question online from Councillor Heather Williams, but I'm going to ask her to write in with the question again for a written response. Um, and I'd like to sum up, sum up briefly the housing numbers yeah. point. Um, I'm t excuse me. Um, I will have to take legal advice on that because I was unaware that you were substituting on this committee. Rory McKenna, could you um, come in, please, for us? Um, Ian Senior, can you respond? I was absolutely unaware that Councillor Heather Williams was sitting today on the committee. Um, would it be an idea to come back to that um, and we move on to allocations whilst you search up the email, Ian Senior, Rory McKenna, or do we need to wait to see? Okay, are we okay to continue whilst that's sorted? And Rory McKenna, could you get back to us? Yeah. Um, okay, lots of detail, and thank you very much for your questions, committee, on that aspect of this. Summarising, and since we're at a first pr proposal stage where we are looking to see how this is going to be shaped going forward. What I am understanding as a broad point from people's comments are that there's a few things like map to be updated, which we've been assured will happen, the color scheme change, change in it, um, identification, we've, I think we've had clarity on what's been densified, where it's been densified and where new homes have been brought forward faster. With the point made by Council Gladman that the trip budgets will have to be in sync with that and not to stop development and we have to be very careful. Um, points raised principally by Council Dr Richard Williams of about jobs, homes and predictions and how it is difficult to predict this kind of thing. I think also the flexibility needed and again with Councillor Cone um, COVID and its impact and how we have to be very mindful of that, not just the homes allocation, but also office space and um, 
jobs in the future and how that will change or will it go back to how it was before to a certain extent. Um, so the major picture here is that flexibility needs to stay in, we need to be alive to what's changing and that this is not in concrete at this moment. Um, I now would like to move on to allocations and um, we have a question from Councillor Peter Fain. Um, I'll be reading out Peter Fain's uh, question because uh, we've got a problem with hearing uh, uh, the team session on the live feed. So question from Councillor Peter Fain on this item is what robust evidence is being relied upon if assuming that East West Rail will definitely go ahead, unlike the expressway, and be in place before the end of the plan period? Is it premature to place reliance upon a particular C2C option being completed by 2025 since the OBR has yet to be considered? There is no um, EIA, no formal decision has been taken by the GCP and it's yet to go to public inquiry or be approved by ministers. Okay, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, infrastructure obviously along with allocations there. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I can say that we have been engaging with uh, East West Rail in the best way that we can. And um, we've also based our um, proposals on information that is publicly available. Um, obviously, the fact that we are uh, taking account of what the government is planning in this area means we are putting our, you know, uh, we're being proactive in ensuring that we um, we are trying to align what we propose with what the uh, government is saying should happen and is encouraging to happen. Um, we don't know for certain, and we've already said this, in the, um, that we don't know for certain when East West Rail will come, but we do know that it will uh, it will come, potentially not until the second half of the plan period. That is as far as we can go uh, for now. In terms of the C2C, um, the C2C is a piece of infrastructure that uh, underpins the delivery of Bonn Airfield as contained in the current adopted local plan. And there needs to be something delivered <laughs> along those lines. Now, the, the pace of development of that, obviously, is down to the GCP. The EIA, uh, Environmental Impact Assessment, is being undertaken now, I believe. Um, and so a decision will be taken uh, sooner rather than later, once that is completed. And it, we, we should bear in mind that the, 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 a lot of this um, has undergone a lot of discussion and thought. We're not just doing this because it's easy to do. It's not easy to do. So all the information we have is out there in the public and it's the best foot forward that we can put at this point in time. Thank you. I will try and ascertain if we have a supplementary from Councillor Peter Fain. Um, can we go back to Rory McKenna, please, for legal advice or an update? Okay, um, I understand that Peter, um, Councillor Peter Fain does not have a supplementary to that question. Um, once again, can Rory McKenna update us on the situation regarding whether Councillor Heather Williams is sitting on this committee this evening or not? Oh, sorry, we have um, Roy McKenna. I can see your 
photo, your vision, <laughs> vision, your image on the screen. <laughs> Are we ready? Okay, since the, that new message has only just come to me now, I will go with the second option, and I, so she will not be sitting on the committee, but I will um, permit her to ask the question via our technical <laughs> system we have here, um, via Councillor Sarah Ching Johnson. I presume you have it written down. So I believe that Councillor Williams is having problems typing into the chat. So if uh, we could ask Councillor Williams to say it on the Teams, I'm going to have to repeat it for the live feed. Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you, um, Councillor Heather Williams. Um, Councillor Sarah Chin Johnson's written it down and will now read it aloud. Thank you. So, paraphrasing Councillor Williams's question, there is some confusion on the housing numbers which refer, which are referred to in the current local plan. There are members uh, here and in parish councillors who don't recognise these numbers. These numbers have come about because of additional housing numbers uh, in different areas. Would Cabinet be able to separate what was in the original plan, what has become additional to that plan, so as to avoid confusion, um, because we're having a situation where residents uh, don't recognise the figures? I hope that's a good summary. Sorry. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, hmm. I'm surprised that some councillors who were here pre-2018 claim they don't recognise those numbers. Um, it's in the current adopted local plans which are available um, on both websites of South Cams and the city. Um, there is this diagram on page 53 of our papers, um, which I think was actually also in the... Um, in the presentation we had earlier on, which says that the new homes already in the pipeline for 2020-2041 is 37,200. And um, they are sites which are already allocated in current local plan and sites which already have planning permission and on windfall sites. 
which are not specifically identified in the plans, but which are policy compliant. So 37,200 is what is in the um, pipeline already, as, as explained. Um, now, I think I understand what um, Councillor Heather Williams is asking. But what we can do um, is provide that number to her as we'll go look in the policy documents and I'm sure we've got them <laughs> and um, give her those numbers as to what is in South Cam's local plan currently. And so Dr. Stephen Hawkins, are you proposing that as a written response or for written the response. trainer? I think. Written response, thank you. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, um, you'll obviously receive a written response to that. Do you have a follow-up question? Councillor Chun Johnson, could you relate, relay that, please? Um, yeah, so uh, just to clarify, Councillor Williams, we can hear you in the room. I'm just paraphrasing for the live feed. So you're just clarifying that the amount of permissions given on top of the current local plans mean that the numbers do not tally. So it's these additional housing numbers that you are requesting. Okay, can I just check, Councillor yeah. Heather Williams, is that a yes to that? Is that a yes? Is that yeah. correct? Thank you. I'll direct that back to Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm sure that we can provide Councillor Heather Williams with uh, a breakdown, which will also include the number of uh, uh, homes that were granted planning permission when the council didn't have a five-year housing land supply pre-2018. Thank you. Okay, moving to now to Councillor Dr. Claire Thornton on yeah. allocation. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, so um, I'm looking at page 100, and 100 to 103 of our agendas, which I think is um, pages 80 to 83 of the local plan document. Um, and and I, 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 it's really a question of clarification on the allocations for Cambridge East. Um, now, Cambridge East is a, a general, well, could be seen in two ways, and it's really a clarification, and I think this will be really important when it goes out uh, for public consultation. Cambridge East can refer to the airport site, to the Marshalls Airport site, which has been taken out of the Greenbelt since 2006 and earmarked for development. But Cambridge East also refers generally to the developments in the East, which include two developments in the current local plan, um, Marley um, on Newmarket Road and land north of Cherry Hinton, which is the far part of the, um, the western part of the airport site. So it is very confusing. And then there's the C Cambridge Area East Action Plan and the Cambridge Eastern Access Scheme. So I would really put in a plea that when this document goes out, for consultation if Cambridge East is referring to the Marshalls Airport site, which will become available in from 2030, that that is made absolutely clear and that the numbers refer to the Cambridge Airport site, the number 7,500 refer to the Cambridge Airport site. I hope my point is clear. Um, Mike, please. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, can you clarify that question, please? Um, I think I understand the, the concern that's been raised, and we will do that along with the mapping clarification, um, as previously promised. 
take Dr. Claire, Councillor Dr. Claire Daunton, any supplementary, or are you happy with that? Um, uh, yes, thank you very much. Yes, obviously, since it's a concern for my ward, it would be really helpful to, to see the clarification before it goes out, if possible. Um, will you be able to take that on board? Thank you very much. Uh, next, Councillor Van der Weyen. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, I have a question about the allocation pool at the Cambridge Biomedical Campus, um, uh, which, which I have raised before, but I, I have a slightly different question about it. So um, just to sort of remind everybody, there's a, a new allocation um, of land uh, for the expansion of the Biomedical Campus um, in the Greenbelt. Uh, and um, so on page 108 of the report, 88 of the, um, uh, of the, of the actual document, um, uh, there's, a, there's a map, uh, so there's the new allocation, which is SCBTA, um, uh, as well as showing the, um, the allocation in the last local plan in, in South Downs, SCBT2, um, which we'll have some debate on uh, uh, in previous years. Um, uh, so there's the allocation and also uh, the introduction of the, this um, area of major change, which is the uh, blue line, which includes um, uh, at the side of, um, of White Hill uh, running down towards Adam Brooks. Um, so um, quite important side, and then running up to the to the edge of, of Nine Wells. Um, so uh, as explained in the policy, uh, this this area that's uh, within the blue line but outside the red line um, is is uh, is proposed to, to be sort of um, uh, part of the, the um, green infrastructure um, uh, landscaped and um, uh, some I mean really exciting things potentially happening there. Um, I, I think the my concern and, and um, uh, um, Jimmy, you'll know very well. <laughs> From how it all went to born, uh, is, that, is that if, if an area is is sort of included in some sense in the policy, um, that, that there's there's room for um, could be room for, for variation uh, and, and pushing the boundaries a little bit um, in, in the future. And I, I was wondering whether whether we couldn't somehow strengthen um, probably more for the, the presentation. Than the chair. Uh, uh, whether we couldn't uh, strengthen um, the the, the Clarity about the, desig the, the the area outside the red line but inside the blue line is is not for development but for, for other uh, other um, uses. Um, so it's a sort of a separate um, uh, uh, allocation rather than part of the, that allocation. I hope uh, that makes a bit of sense. But and I hope you can sort of sense the danger. To me, undoubtedly can. So. Councillor Doctor Timmy Hawkins, please respond. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you, um, I do understand where um, Councillor Dr. Van der Waal is coming from, um, and I'm sure that we should be able to have a look at the wording of that policy and make it stronger so that we don't end up with development in that area that is within the blue, but outside the, the red. So I hear him, and we will do our best to make sure that's the case. Is there a follow-up, or are you happy with that answer? Okay. Councillor Dr. Richard Williams, a question. Thank you, Chair. There are actually two questions, but they're very short. Um, so, uh, allocation in uh, Great Shelford, um, between Mingle Lane and Hinton Way, could some indication be given for that allocation of the maximum capacity with improved access? It's a 10-hectare site. It's been taken out of the green belt. It was rejected before, but it, it, it's being put forward this time. But it's only being suggested for 100 homes. Nobody will build at 10 houses per hectare on that site. Um, it's going to be much more, um, I would imagine, because of the premium that will be um, available on houses um, to create better access. So I think, to be fair to the residents of Great Shelford, um, some more clarity on, on the maximum capacity of that one would, would be helpful. Um, secondly, close to home, Whittlesford Parkway, um, there's a proposed special policy area um, I understand the reasons for that because of the GCP proposals, um, but there are actually two listed buildings in that proposed um, special policy area. Um, there's the Duxford Chapel and there's, there's the Red Lion. Is it? Um, so I, I can't see any reference for that, and I would imagine that the presence of those buildings could impact quite significantly on what's possible in at least part of that site. So I'd like to see that uh, reflected, uh, if it could be, in the consultation. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Doctor, Council Dr. Hawkins, um, which question first? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, 
I'll take the second one first, uh, Whittlesford Parkway. Um, obviously, this is, this is uh, the stage where we're at now where we're looking at it as an option. Uh, policies are not firmed up yet, but we are hoping that we will get feedback from um, all concerned when it does go, go to consultation. Um, I understand your concern, um, but again, uh, you know, we've had developments near to close to opposite to listed buildings, and those, you know, it, it's not it's not an impediment. It just might affect what gets built. But um, yes, um, we will listen to consultation feedback. On the first one, I'm not sure we know what the maximum, we probably do might be able to work out what the maximum capacity might be if, if there was a second access. I mean, that is an if. What we are allocating now or proposing to allocate now doesn't have that access. So you're asking us to do uh, over and above what we're currently proposing. Um, I think perhaps I'll ask Jonathan if he might come in on, on this. So at the moment, clearly, it's proposed for 100 dwellings for a Go ahead. So, okay. Um, at the moment, it's clearly proposed for 100 dwellings reflecting the site access and policy. We also need to acknowledge that um, it would need to um, accommodate um, significant landscaping, um, particularly reflecting the, the edge of village location. And that, that is what is included in the plan. Clearly, if, if an alternative access was put forward, we'd need to look again at that site as it may come into consultation. But our proposal is clearly as set out with 100 dwellings for landscaping and so on. Um, a follow-up? Just, just, just a quick one. Can I just, just, just press that point? Because, you know, all the other allocations have got densities of, you know, 30 dwellings per hectare, 40, I think, on one of the Melbourne sites. So I, I think it would be helpful to residents if, if we could get some indication, because I think everybody can see what it's likely to be with improved access. Yeah, okay. Councillor Henry Batchelor. Thank you, Chair. I've got a comment and then a question, if I may. Um, just add a bit of variety, and I'd just actually like to speak up generally in support of the allocations policy. Um, I was hoping when the allocations were released that we would be following the similar uh, general policy of trying to concentrate, um, to concentrate the housing numbers into existing and forthcoming larger settlements rather than disperse them amongst the villages, as we have done in the last, i.e. the current local plan that we're, we're operating within. Um, so I was pleased to see that when the allocations were released. I mean, as someone who represents uh, an entirely rural area with no large settlements within it, uh, the very much the feeling from, from the villages is we'd like to remain as villages and remain the, retain the rural way of life. So I was just like to speak up generally in support of that particular allocations policy. Um, question was more about process. So presumably after this, um, this local plan proposal goes through the various public consultations and committee stages, we will, as a council, have to have to agree and sign it off. Given the fact it's a joint local plan with Cambridge City, would, what would happen if we're in the situation where we, as South Cams, agreed to the local plan but the city didn't and had, had concerns? Would it simply fall dead or what would be the process there? Councillor Dr Tim Hawkins, I'll pass that to you. I'm hoping you can respond. Oh, well, um, I would like to think we wouldn't bring a plan to council that hasn't been uh, talked through by both authorities and agreed to in principle. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> would you like to ask for help from Paul Craner? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Paul Craner. What will we do? I think the question, and, I'm, and I will have to check this, but it will have to be agreed by both councils yeah. and committees. Can and you speak into your mic? Please. Sorry. I, it, as far as I would understand, it would be, have to be agreed by both councils' committees. That's why, obviously, we put a huge amount of time to working through that with all members to try and come up with a plan that's, you know, that meets both. And it's a very, you know, it's a very tricky thing to do a joint plan, but um, 
you know, I think that's that's the, the key point from a governance perspective would need to be agreed by both council committees to go for consultation in November. And as a point of reference, the Planning and Transport Scrutiny Committee for Cambridge City, I think, is next week or the following week, so it would be decided at that meeting. Do you have a follow-up? No, just to say, sorry for putting you on the spot there, but it's uh, stranger things have happened, so thank you. Councillor Chung Johnson. Uh, my comment is on the Oakington site. Um, so just as a heads up, you will get tremendous amount of opposition to this site. Um, I would just recommend that for consultation that you uh, put in a little bit more justification for the cho choice of this site, other than the proximity to the busway, because obviously it is in Greenbelt, but it is on flood land. Oakington itself feels like it is already being swallowed up by North Sado, um, and it just feels a little bit picked on, especially as we are um, trumpeting that most of this plan does not affect villages, um, but it, it feels like it's it's been hit by the double whammy of having both North Sado and these additional houses in its plan. So. Um, my request, if we could, would just beef up the justification because it is quite thin. Thank you. Can you take that on board, Councillor Dr. Kimi Hawkins? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, we will make sure that we have additional information um, that goes out with public consultation. And, Chair, if I might do you, whilst I still have the floor, just to say thank you to Councillor Bachelor for his comments um, on the uh, allocations. Much you appreciated. Indeed. Um, Councillor Peter Fain has a follow-up on his allocation question, which I believe um, Councillor Chin Johnson will read out. So on behalf of Councillor Peter Fain, what evidence do we have that all the criteria in NPPF paragraph 141 for exceptional circumstances to justify removal of land from Greenbelt have been met, particularly in relation to the 10-hectare site in Great Shelford, um, including... B, optimises the density of development. But before you answer, Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, um, a number of questions have merged with the allocations in Greenbelt. So if we take any other Greenbelt questions at the moment, um, and this is one of them. Uh, thank you, Chair. Through you. Um, I mean, obviously, we are aware of the sensitivities uh, of the Greenbelt. And what I can say broadly is that we wouldn't be bringing um, or making proposals in the preferred options uh, to take land out of the green belt if we hadn't considered all the, um, uh, the circumstances that would justify it. Um, I mean, some might say that we haven't given enough information, but um, we will try and provide uh, more uh, where it's possible to do so. But um, to Councillor Fain's question, I would say that we have considered um, the exceptional circumstances in line with the uh, MPPF paragraph that he quotes. I'm not sure there's anything else we can add to that. Um, do you require, so Paul Frayner, would you like to allocate the officer to answer? Yeah, thanks. So I think the, the matter is explored in quite significant detail within the topic paper. Sorry, the mic again, a little bit closer. Right. I've never been told I've got a quiet voice before. So um, I think the matter in, on Greenbelt and exceptional circumstances is explored in quite significant detail within the topic paper within the document library on, on the published um, documents. So, so I think it's okay, so I think Councillor Peter Fane is there in detail. Okay. Councillor Cathcart. Just briefly, uh, yes, I'd just like to really echo what uh, uh, Councillor Batchelor has just said, that uh, I think the officers have done a good job in crafting a plan which has actually uh, recognised that many of the existing villages have significant growth over the, over the years, um, and the vast bulk of the rural area has broadly escaped uh, development. Um, so I think that's something that actually personally it should be welcomed and I think many members would, would probably agree to that. Um, uh, it's not as if the existing villages won't take any development. Uh, there are developments already in the pipeline which are going through. Uh, there are windfall sites that could be significant in the context of many villages and there are um, neighbourhood plan opportunities for those villages that uh, are seeking development that will actually enhance the local uh, uh, environment. 
environment and, and the population's needs. And this plan recognises the individuality and diversity of individual settlements and villages and the need to retain and enhance that. So I think it's too welcome. Thank you. Um, Councillor Cohn, is your thought on allocations to Greenbelt topic area? Thanks very much, Chair. So, um, so uh, like uh, Councillor Cathcart and uh, Councillor Batcher, there are many of my villages that are protected uh, via the um, current local plan and this emerging local plan. But also within my ward, there are villages that you know have got very large-scale developments on their doorstep coming about because of this plan. Um, if you looked at Tevisham and the um, development on the airfield that sits adjacent to their village, which sort of brings them very close to, to sort of being in the city at that point. Um, and then if you also looked at um, the kneecap development, a direct result of that development is that the water treatment plant has to move, um, taking land out of Greenbelt um, between Hallingsey and Fenditton, which isn't illustrated within the, the plan. Um, so I suppose my question is, should we, um, for transparency's sake, um, have that um, with, included within the, the maps and um, as uh, an impact on Greenbelt within this local plan, given that they're hand in glove? Um, yeah, so that's my question. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you, uh, thank you, Councillor Cathcart, uh, for your comments. Much appreciated. Um, obviously, as I said uh, right at the beginning, what we've tried to do is to um, listen and take account of what we heard from residents when we had the first conversation. Um, regarding uh, Councillor Cohn's comments, um, let me just remind us that Cambridge Airport was taken out of the Green Belt um, and is a protected safeguarded, beg your pardon, safeguarded is a word, safeguarded development site. Um, so it's not a new um, site in the sense of it's brand new to this plan. It's been safeguarded from previous plans. I think last, what one, uh, Cambridge Airport and the same for uh, North East Cambridge. Um, and of course at the time, uh, yes, the, it was predicated on the possibility of the water uh, treatment plant uh, moving, and that is now a distinct possibility, which is why we are now able to um, include it in the current local plan. And I think you will be aware, Councillor Kuhn, that we have been working on um, an area action plan um, for North East Cambridge. Um, we are doing that because that is what we can do. The actual relocation itself is not our project. It is uh, being undertaken by uh, Anglian Water. And the fact that it's been relocated to a, a, a site in the Greenbelt um, is, it's in the Greenbelt, it's not specifically part of this plan. <laughs> so I'm, I'm afraid I will not agree with your, it's hand in glove, so we should um, you know, include the relocation uh, in our plan, it's not, in our plan, it's not work that we are doing, and we will not be taking responsibility for that. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Cohn? Um, just to say that um, uh, Councillor Hawkins, uh, Dr. Councillor Jimmy Hawkins, is correct that um, you know both these sites, have, or in the current local plan, um, have been um, you know either taken out of uh, green belt, but. I think it is true to say that neither of those sites have been allocated any housing numbers. It's only in the current or this emerging local plan that they're allocated housing numbers. And um, it was um, the uh, lead officer for planning, Stephen Kelly, that described the two sites as hand in glove, not, not me. Councillor Cohn, is that a question or just a comment? Don't require a response, or would you like to respond? Uh, through you, Chair. Um, noted about the comment hand in glove, um, what, whatever that is, whatever that means. Um, the reason that numbers were not allocated prior to now was because conditions were not right. 
The whole point of safeguarding a site is to say we want to develop this site, we will develop it at the time when the conditions are right, when certain things can happen. With Northeast Cambridge, it was when the water treatment plant could move, and now it is moving. And with Cambridge Airport, it's when marshals are certainly going to move, and they have confirmed that they are moving, and they will be moving by 2030. So that's why the numbers can now be allocated. That's the whole point of safeguarding. Thank you, Chair. OK, on this topic of Greenbelt, we have Councillor Bradnam, and then after that, I'd like to move on to the environmental impact, since I think we um, discussed this one fairly thoroughly, allocations and greenbelt together. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to also talk, make a statement really uh, about the greenbelt and I just wanted to welcome uh, the reiteration of our intention to respect, as we are obliged to, the NPPF protections afforded to the greenbelt and especially so between the villages of Milton, Piston and Impington. Uh, because our, without this section of green belt space between the villages, which I very much appreciate, um, to protect the merging of these villages, they would either merge with each other, uh, as we're under a great deal of pressure in our area at the moment, um, or indeed they would merge with the north of Cambridge. And we, we, you know, I'm very grateful that that hasn't, is not an area that's been taken out of the green belt allocation because it's extremely precious to the northeast corner of Cambridge. So thank you very much. Councillor Bradman, just a comment then for a response. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Um, just to say thank you to you for your comments. We acknowledge that and obviously we, we want to do our best for, uh, for all concerned. We won't always have it right, but we'll do the best we can. Thank you. Okay, I'll just summarise very briefly, some of the points which have come up in that part of the discussion, which I'm sure Ian Senior Democratic Services Officer is making copious notes, and he will assist at the end of this meeting. Okay, so Councillor Bastia was saying in support of the policy of keeping the housing numbers in the larger settlements and close to the city and protecting our rural um, villages and a number of other councillors also reflected that in their comments. Um, Councillor Fame was aware of the sensitivities of the green belt and the exceptional circumstances and that was something also that Councillor Dr Williams was, Richard Williams was very concerned about um, Great Shelford one particularly being taken out of the green belt and if you're going to do that I think I'm right in summarising um, the allocation of number of homes at the moment isn't really kind of likely, shall we say. Um, then moving on to uh, Councillor Cathcart was broadly um, very supportive of the general direction of the plan and its approach to allocation. And we also have, just running through the notes I've made, um, Councillor Cohn has expressed concern about the Anglian water move to, um, of the water treatment plant to release that brownfield site, although it was pointed out that that is beyond our control as a local planning authority in the sense that it's a government, central government sort of decision with the HIF bid to support the numbers of housing which could come forward and hence why areas have been safeguarded along with the airport marshals. And finally, Councillor Bradnam welcomed the protection of the Green Belt, as do I, in between Milton, Histon, Limpington, and the um, making sure we do protect as much as we possibly can in accordance with the national planning policy framework and just to stop everything merging together. I would like to now move on to any questions on the kind of overall environmental impact. So we're looking at climate change, um, biodiversity, etc. And Councillor Hunt. Apologies, and Councillor Bradman. I was just going to say, does, would anybody appreciate a pause, a comfort break at all? We've been going for four since four thirty. Um, I was quite happy to move um, carry on, but. If we have 
Shall we call five minutes? Five minutes, ten minutes max, okay.
Okay. Um, thank you. We start off the comfort break and environmental impact in its fairly general sense. Um, Councillor Steve Hunt. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'd like to talk about the section around the net zero carbon new buildings, um, page 166, 167 in our papers. Um, I'm delighted to see that we are going to insist on higher standards of energy efficiency and so forth in building regulations. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's fantastic to see that because so many times uh, in planning, we've been told that we can't insist on that, and now we can because of this new plan, so that's wonderful progress. Um, but then I see on page 166 that there's what appears to be a bit of a get-out clause for developers who can't meet the requirements, who might be able to offset or future-proof to enable retrofitting. Now, I think we all know retrofitting is not a desirable solution to insulation and energy efficiency. So my question is, what will be the criteria and how strict can we make those criteria so this does not become kind of an easy-to-use get-out clause to not meet these high standards we want to achieve? Um, and just a sort of small supplementary thing to that is on page 165. No new development should be connected to the gas grid. I wonder about that because are we not making an assumption about the uh, future energy mix? I mean, it may well be that, uh, that carbon neutral gas, um, biogas or something might become significant or indeed pipe hydrogen might become significant. So do we really want developments that may have to be dug up to put gas mains in, should that come about. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, two questions there. Please take both of them. Thank you, Chair, and uh, <coughs> thank you for the comfort break. <laughs> um, yes, <My> we, <laughs> we uh, couldn't insist, or we can't currently insist on um, certain um, uh, requirements for uh, reaching net zero carbon on buildings because it's not in the current local plan. So obviously we're trying to now uh, address that, making sure that we put that in the current plan. Um, there are times when you can meet all the requirements on the site. And from what we've seen so far, there are times when you can't and you might have to offset it. Um, away from the site, though that, will, that is the least preferred option. Um, policy wording, I'm sure we can work on that and strengthen it, <laughs> but we take note of that and we make sure that um, uh, there is a loophole, so to speak, so that those, <laughs> those requirements are not met. Okay. Um, on the issue of gas and gas main, I think we we refer at this point to natural gas main, um, bearing in mind that government has decreed um, that it's 2025, correct, 2025 there, will be, there should be no more connections to mains gas. So we're taking that into account um, in the current plan. Now, I don't know if the current network will be um, suitable for non-natural, <laughs> I can't remember what to go, but you know, other types of gas. Um, but, you know, it's what it is. We're, we're, we're monitoring and we'll have to wait and see what comes up further down the line. Councillor Hunt, you have a follow-up. Yeah, just thank you for the answer, um, Dr. Councillor uh, Tumi. Um, I think uh, I, I understand your points about we can't know what's going to happen. My understanding is that, you know, biogas, for example, will go down ordinary gas mains and there are uh, companies trying to prove feasibility of sending hydrogen down them. So um, but my other point would be that there probably are commercial and industrial uses of gas who will not be phased out as early as domestic boilers. And we have to consider that developments do include commercial premises. Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins. Thank, thank you for that. I'm sure um, we'll... Yeah. Paul Frain, are you okay. going to step in here? Thank you, yes. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. I think we, we note that I think that hydrogen, we understand, is not really readily for residential properties. It may be better used in heavy industries. And Tim is right, in fact, uh, 2025, it will be phased out for residential. But noting your policy wording, I mean, offsetting and future-proofing future only are going to be considered for certain 
very strict kinds of development where density is you know, only allowed for renewables to be provided in certain ways. So I think certainly this is the consultation we're talking to, to be able to provide feedback, not just residents, but over those who are you know, delivering these solutions going forward as well, so we can understand what the opportunities are for them. But um, in terms of, for us, we need to be able to plan for readiness as well to be able to keep people's homes and those building standards as well. Thank you. Um, Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am looking at uh, page, oh, I was looking at page 212, I think. Uh, but rest assured, I, I find the assurances concerning, I'm, I'm thinking about water sufficiency and water relations. Um, so I find the assurances concerning sufficiency of water supply itemized on both page 27 of the document and page 41, uh, very reassuring. But referring to page 156 of, our, of the document, which relates to the policy around flooding and integrated water management, um, I had crafted a request that we might use some of the wording that came from the response to the uh, first conversation uh, and insert it in our policy, and I'll explain how. Um, so the original on page um, 156 of the document under what consultation have we done on this issue, I'd like to, I would propose that we look at that wording uh, not amend that, but use that wording amended slightly in the policy so that we could say uh, on page um, 155 under the proposed policy direction, after the sentence where we say, it's in the bottom paragraph on that page uh, where it refers about what developments will be required to do and it says suds and green or brown roofs should provide multiple benefits such as biodiversity and amenity. And then to add in, um, development must demonstrate it is resilient or adapt to flooding. Flood management policies will ensure that the risk of flooding in the area is not increased as a result of new development. Uh, so that would give a, a strong steer to our, our policy direction. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, or if you want to pass that to Paul Frayner, if it's more detailed, can you answer? Uh, I think I can. Um, I understand uh, where Councillor Bradman is coming from, and I thank her for the suggestion. Um, when it comes to flood resilience, we must not forget that we rely on a flood organisation, uh, the Flood Authority, uh, that we consult on on all applications. Um, we can require um, certain things, but at the end of the day, we do rely on them to tell us when a proposal does meet their criteria for being flood resilient. Um, we, I think what I will do is ask Councillor Bradnam to send us the proposed wording. We can then have a look at that and make sure that uh, we're not proposing something that we cannot deliver ourselves, that we're relying on the, you know, uh, the flood authority for. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Bradman? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dr Hawkins. Um, this comes from my concern that any development should not increase the risk of flooding elsewhere, which I appreciate is a, it's a kind of, it cuts across both planning and flood resilience planning. And I would just like this authority in developing its planning policies and in its thought processes approaching approval of any given planning application, that it would be mindful that no development should increase the risk of flooding to any other property. So uh, if we can bear that in mind, I, I would appreciate if we could put some wording into the policy to protect against that, and I'll certainly send you the, the wording. Thank you. Answer, Dr. Timmy Hawking, can you answer that? 
Yes, Chair, just to say I'm quite, um, you know, I'm quite aware of the issues regarding um, flooding because I've had to deal with some of that uh, myself. And there's uh, concerns expressed by, you know, residents across the coast, you know, you're doing this and you're doing, you know, somebody else is doing that. But we have to work with um, flood organizations, our statutory consultees, and we will need to do that better going forward. So I appreciate the, um, the comments that's been made by Councillor Bradman. And I'm sure you can send in the wording that you would like anyway. Thank you. Um, Councillor Dr. Martin Khan. Basically, I was commenting on the, uh, the condition which has determined the numbers, uh, which is the uh, problem about water supply. Um, Please direct your comments into the mic. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I was talking about the uh, problem about um, water supply, which has been a constraint on numbers. Um, I absolutely agree with that. That's a big concern, and the fact that there's no clear evidence of investment in, in, into providing water supply. Um, uh, I'm worried about the fact that when you have a, um, a development, when you apply for an application, uh, they always say, well, the water authority is bound to provide provide a supply a sewage or water to the site and it's not used as a reason for refusal. Now if this is taken to the plan scale, the fact that it's not, it's not going to be supplied it, it is not may not be considered by the minister as a valid reason for refu um, for restricting the development. I wondered what, what how you would approach that problem if it arose when we when we approach the minister. I agree with the the, the proposal but I'm worried about how it might be received. Councillor Dr. Tune Hawkins, can you respond? Uh, yes, Chair, uh, potentially in part. Um, we have obviously listened to um, the comments we've had back, and we know that water supply is a big concern, which is why we have put that on, you know, up front to say, you know, this, this, uh, objectively assessed need requires this many houses and offices and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we can't deliver that if this major infrastructure um, is not in place. And we will have to justify that um, at examination. But we do know that there are plans uh, in place by the water authorities and water resources in East. Um, to actually address the issue. Now, we don't have control of the timetable for that, but we do know that, for example, uh, there's a reservoir planned which might come after 2030, but you know the plan starts 2020 to 2041. So what do we do in the meantime? Uh, there is already talk about piping water from other areas that have... Um, supply that we could use. Now again, I don't have details of that yet. Um, we are at the early stage of this plan and we would expect to know more as time goes on as to how the issues can be addressed. But um, in, just to say, sort of as a, I hate to use the word backstop, but <laughs> um, if, if, if the issue isn't resolved <coughs> timely, then obviously we might have to just phase in the development. So we are considering all these issues and we will make sure that we're not putting um, our communities in a difficult position um, and ourselves really, because at the end of the day, we're the planning authority, but we're not the water authority. <laughs> Councillor, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, yes, simply to, to ask that um, it, clearly there's a, if you have problems with the minister. With, with the chair. Sorry, if you, if you are in the minister, uh, have problems with the minister when this is a, a, the plan is presented, will this be, uh, is there any precedent of such issues being used to um, be supported in a plan or refused in planning, uh, uh, local plans in previous times? Will there be a, uh, an experience? An experimental plan. Uh, I'm, I'm not necessarily that's necessarily a bad thing, but I just think we ought to know about it. <laughs> Councillor Dr. Hawkins. Thank you, Chair. I don't know if 
this is an issue that has come up before, so I will defer. Paul Freyner. <laughs> I will defer to Paul Freyner in the first instance. This one will turn up your mic. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm not aware of, of any... Paul Freyner, can you <laughs> raise your mic, please, <laughs> and address the whole room? At the same time, I'm not aware currently of any specific plans, but I, that doesn't mean that they, doesn't, they don't exist currently. I think that we've um, put water really at the forefront um, of how we've, you know, we've presented this published work for the preferred option as essentially we have a development strategy, but it is relying on the fact that water infrastructure at a regional scale that solves these problems is absolutely crucial to it being deliverable. Um, and at this stage of plan making, which is a slightly less formal stage than we get down further down the line, it's a regulation 18, we can explore those options and we are working quite um, closely as much as possible with partners, both Water Resources East and the water companies to you know, say that this is an issue that you, you know, we have to kind of work through. Um, and again, with government, and obviously the opportunities and um, the ambitions around the Oxcam Arc may well be something that we can use to ensure that government understand how critical this is to the nature of what we're trying to achieve here. But obviously, you know, we haven't shied away from you know presenting a plan that is incumbent on the fact that you know we have a water issue here, which is um, a, a hugely problematic issue unless it's solved at a regional scale in terms of proper interventions. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a number of more, spe more speakers on the list um, in order Ka Councillor Cathcart, Councillor Harvey, Councillor Van der Weyer, um, Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. I am sensing that the environmental impact and the infrastructure is merging a bit, so if we open those two up, because they do overlap, and um, I'll take Councillor Cathcart next. <coughs> Thank, thank you. Yes, the, uh, the water supply is crucial, as you mentioned, and clearly the report is stubborn with references of conditionality and provisions for um, uh, uh, this, expressing the importance of the subject. Um, uh, the last time I went we around the Conservation Committee, um, the actual nature of the underground water system is actually perfectly understood as far as I know. Um, I don't think anyone has actually done any serious work on it, so we don't actually know how the whole thing flows, at least that was the case a number of years ago. Um, and uh, uh, I'm a bit concerned that the water companies don't really seem to have done a huge amount of work. There's vague talk about a, a reservoir and the fens and various other things that may be pumping it from other locations. But the amount of work is vast, and the amounts of money are vast as well, so I think that's something we need to look at. But it also feeds into the uh, other, uh, which is first touches on infrastructure as well, but there's a reference there to repair and reinstatement of the area's chalk streams. Uh, so what we're looking at is not just um, maintenance of a status quo, i.e. keeping things from deteriorating. We're looking actually for an improvement. We're looking for a way to actually bring the flows back to the chalk streams, and we're looking for ways to manage them in a way that they will actually flourish again as they did many years ago. Now, that can only be done if we do manage our water resources properly and actually find some way of replenishing the springs and reinstating the flow, which is not easy, but it can be done because rivers can repair themselves uh, if actually they're given the chance. So uh, people, in fact, if they give them a chance, uh, you'll get well. Uh, a chalk stream will recover, but it does need that commitment. And I'm glad to see it's actually enshrined here. Um, and that's something that needs to be worked on. Um, the other thing, just one or two quick, quick, quick items. Uh, uh, buildings, uh, one state was talking about having a policy for the reuse of existing buildings, which is actually quite a sound environmental policy because there's a huge amount of embedded carbon in existing buildings to demolish them and build something on the same site. It's often very wasteful uh, in terms of actually uh, our, our carbon footprint. So it would be nice to see something here, a presumption in favour of reuse of existing buildings where it's possible. Clearly, it can't be done in every case, or even the majority of the cases, but it can be, I think, considered as part of our policy of, a, of a, say, a, a, a presumption in favour of reuse of existing buildings where this is sensible and practical, and something along those lines. 
And the other thing I've got is um, public footpaths under, um, I don't know, public um, well-being, I think. I looked and looked in vain for some reference. To, perhaps it's there and it has escaped me. Uh, public footpaths, which are such an important asset in our villages, and especially connecting, interconnecting between villages, in fact. And there's a whole network of redundant or semi-redundant or generic derelict footpaths that could be helped enormously in the well-being agenda. So I think that's something perhaps during the later stage of this process we can actually look at and see if we can actually do anything about that. And just a last point. Um, uh, there is talk about conservation, which is excellent. Uh, uh, but many of our villages, uh, we have a, a stock of listed buildings and important buildings. We talk about heritage assets, but looking at the document, it looks it's slanted, which is right and proper, very much in favour of Cambridge City, with its fine stock of important nationally and internationally important buildings. But side by side, that every single village, or most of them, have a fine high street, in fact, uh, which would benefit from some degree of improvement. Uh, so there is a conservation issue here, We're looking at how we can actually improve the quality of our high streets. Again, it's long term, uh, but uh, and also conservation areas and how we can actually uh, bring those uh, more to fruition. So I think there's an issue here that could be embedded in this report. So there are about four, three or four issues there, I think. And so Dr. Tina Hawkins, please take them in the order you wish. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, I'll take the water first. Um, I think in terms of uh, dealing with this problem, yes, you know, we, we identify, we know it needs to be resolved. Uh, the chalk stream is of particular uh, concern, um, as we know. Uh, but the, the water authorities and DEFRA and those responsible are looking at the potential solutions. But one thing I need to emphasize here is that there seems to be this, what I call a wrong emphasis on house building being the cause of water shortage. It is not. We all use water, commercial, business, leisure, agriculture. These are all big users of water. House building and residential is just another user. So uh, I'd like us to kind of get that in context <laughs> so that we're looking at water replenishment for all these other uses, not just for house building. Um, but, you know, the, the, the solutions potentially, hopefully, will come as. Um, uh, Mr. Frena has uh, explained previously, working with the other bodies that can do something about it. We are the planning authority, we are not the water authority, but we work with those other bodies um, to try and solve this problem. Your point about uh, footpaths, yes. <laughs> it's not just footpaths, it's cycle paths as well, you know, linking linking our villages to make them more sustainable so people can get from perhaps the smaller ones to the larger ones where they can get a bus or um, something like that. So um, in terms of policies, I'm not sure what we can do, but I will leave my um, colleagues to, answer, uh, to add more to that. Reuse of buildings, it won't always be possible. <laughs> um, but I'm sure when possible, I mean, even now, um, you know, we do try and get buildings to be reused, but a lot of the time you do find that they're perhaps in a state that they can be used or you know, the conversion is even more difficult than just knocking it down and building something else. Um, we can't be prescriptive, but we can encourage through policies to make sure that buildings are reused wherever possible. Um, at this point, I will hand over to Mr. Freyner. We can talk about heritage assets. <laughs> and anything else I might have missed that would be helpful to answer your question. I'm going to speak into the mic and address yeah. everybody this time. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so thank you, thank you for your points, and, and they are very important. I think that we have covered a little bit around the reuse of buildings and the circular life cycle of construction materials within 
some of the policy framework under the theme of climate change. So um, there's a policy, emerging policy direction around um, around reducing waste in construction as well. So that does, but we can certainly look at that and tighten some of that policy wording up as we go through, as I've said before, we're, we're still quite in early stages to the point of, I suppose, this first opening up is to say, you know, this is our direction of travel in terms of some of those policies. What do you think? And, you know, what do stakeholders think in terms of the deliverability of those policies as we go forward? And again, the same with the heritage assets, which essentially covers heritage assets, but regardless of location. But again, we can also look at tightening up some of the, the wording in there as we move forward as well. Yeah. Councillor Cathcart, do you have a follow up or? Um, getting back to water, um, you touched on this, and this is the question of obstruction licenses, which there are not a lot around. I don't know how many are now. But when it was last looked at, we were horrified to find that many of them were virtually irrevocable, in fact. Now, I don't know what the present situation is, but that's something we could look at to see because uh, there are so many obstruction licenses. And I don't know exactly what their status is at the current uh, point in time, but if something can be looked at to see whether anything can be done about them revoking them, mitigating them, I don't know what. And there may be, a, there may be an issue there. At least we actually can address that. Stephen, we're over to help. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins, any response? <laughs> Paul Frayne. Thank you. I think it actually has been looked at, but I'm happy to go away and, and check that out for you and come back to you if you'd like a written response on that. Is that, I think we have actually had a look, I think it's part of the Evans Road project. We're going to have to check on that. Thank you. Um, Councillor Jeff Harvey. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, referring back to uh, Councillor Hunt's um, comments, um, I also applaud the ambition in terms of uh, reaching effectively zero carbon for new homes. And I, I just wondered, um, in the uh, climate change topic paper, it, it says, um, I haven't got it in front of me, but we've not gone as far as setting requirements for all new houses to achieve passive house, although so we will go beyond existing building standards. But um, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, you know, there'd be quite a lot of work um, to define the hurdle um, or, or the sort of setting of that bar um, in terms of something that's sufficiently uh, complex that it achieves the end, but is not so complicated that it invites sort of endless um, negotiations from developers. Um, and, and I just wondered, I mean, obviously, do, would we, for example, go for some sort of already developed standard like the old Code 6, or, or if not, I mean, is, is it worth possibly looking wider than Greater Cambridge to kind of team up with other local authorities that are trying to achieve the same end? Because it, it sounds like it could be quite a complicated um, piece of policy to write. Councillor so Dr. Timmy Hawkins, would you like to take that one? Uh, with your permission, I will um, pass that on to Mr. Freiner. Okay, Mr. Paul Freiner. I think I'm going to pass to John Dixon on this one because he hasn't spoken yet, and I think he would like to speak on this matter because he's very close. John to Dixon. Me. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm actually cheating slightly and cribbing from our sustainability officer is on the end of the Akeem's message, but. Um, Passive House is almost a, a brand name, but we've done a lot of work um, with our uh, looking at our net zero project as to what an appropriate standard for our area would be. Passive House is still challenging to deliver. It requires experienced practitioners. Not all developers have access to it. Um, the standards that come out of our study are technically feasible across a range of developments and achieve a very, very close level of improvement to Passive House. Um, but we think that the standards our study has come out as a more effective and deliverable and technically demonstrated how it can be done. Our sustainability officer who advises on these issues is very clear that uh, developers will have a clear understanding from that policy guidance and the policies that are evolving of how to implement those policies. And we can also if necessary, supplement our policies in the eventual plan in supplementary guidance. So in short, we think they offer a very 
effective method of securing uh, improvements and sustainable dwellings. Any follow up, Councillor Harvey? No, that, that was fine, thank you. Um, Paul Frayner, I think you want to add an additional comment? Yes, just a point of clarity on, on working with other councils. I think that we note that carbon, zero carbon policies are relatively new in planning policy and plan making as we go forward, and it's, it's one of the, the biggest areas that we've had to really look at in detail from this point of view. We are working, and as you'll know, that we're part of a group of councils along the Ox Cam Arc where a detailed set of environmental principles have been established um, by the local leadership there. And it's certainly something that from a bottom-up perspective as local councils, we need to be pushing in terms of understanding how we can work together as councils to say the need is real in terms of delivering on those objectives around reaching net zero and meeting the six carbon budget as set out this year. Thank you. Asper van der Weyer. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, I'd like to uh, expand a little bit on um, uh, Councillor Khan's question about um, uh, water supply. Um, uh, th there are um, in this policy, in, in, in this um, proposal, uh, several innovative, innovative policies, some of which we've talked about, some of which we haven't. Uh, water usage, for example. Um, and I think the, the acceleration um, of housing is, a, is a sort of there's some innovation there, um, uh, which obviously brings with it risks. And um, uh, I was wondering what, during the, the process of developing the plan, we, we could be doing to um, uh, sort of mitigate and assess those those risks, because undoubtedly uh, developers in particular will be challenging them uh, because they'll affect um, their um, uh, viability, profits, and also um, uh, some sites um, which, which have been excluded because of some of these policies. Um, obviously, we, we, as, as Paul saying earlier on, we're at relatively early stage, so there's, there's plenty of time to do that. But I'm not wondering what sort of thinking there is at the moment about, about how we're going to be managing those risks through to um, uh, inspection. And so, Dr. Hawkins. Okay. Um, I think I understood your question is how do we manage the risks of water usage now before? No, 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 policy process. Um, how is the risk of challenge to the, to the innovative policies? Uh, the, the risk of challenge, over to Mr. Freyner. <laughs> Paul Freyner. Thank you, Councillor Hawkins. I think, as you'll all be aware, plan making is not inherently risky um, piece of work. But um, what I would say is that the reason for the huge volumes and tomes of evidence that you've got just at this particular early stage of the process is where we you know, really have to cover every single base and it is very much a systems process. All of those evidence bases do feed in. There are obviously risks and challenge because at the end of the process we do go through an independent examination. That's why we have to detail our process all the way through and be robust and consistent about how we've, how we've worked and iterated the plan process. There are also checks and balances in place around, you know, if we're talking around the viability of delivering some of the new and innovative policies, which I think you referred to certainly around some of these areas, that currently, they're, you know, they, at this stage, they have been tested to the extent that they've been worked up. So we're confident in them at the moment, but that will continue to happen all the way through the process alongside the sustainability appraisal and some of those other checks and balances that we do all the way through. Um, I, I would say that you know, this is probably the most significant piece of evidence-based work that I've seen in, in planning in this area. And, and you know, there is some very different, bigger pieces, as we know, about climate and water. But um, you know, that's the reason why we've put a huge amount of effort into ensuring those evidence bases robust and come together um, as, as seamlessly as possible. Do you have a follow-up? Um, Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's um, an another question about water. Now, we know and we've known, and I think we all agree, um, we've known since November that water is a, is a problem, it's a constraint. We had a report in November you know, casting doubt on the deliverability of the medium growth scenario, the one that's been chosen. 
Um, and that's why there's, there's talk about you know, um, getting the government to step in. Um, so we've known that for a while. My question really is why has the evidence that the medium growth scenario can't really be delivered, or at least not sustainable on current water supply, why did that not act as a constraint on the proposed number of houses to be developed? Because it, it could have been, it could be cited as a constraint, um, and then we wouldn't be in the, you know, because the solution seems to be, oh, the government has to step in, or if the government doesn't step in, we'll have to have a, a phased approach. It seems like this 49,000 number is fixed. That is not going to change. And, you know, um, everything else had to be made to work around it. Why is, wasn't water regarded as a constraint on building? Final point, I would understand if you were proposing to build at the standard method that you think it would be difficult to go below that. But given that you're proposing to build way above the standard method, I would have thought you could quite reasonably argue that actually water is a constraint on development um, and it should come down below the number that you're um, OAN, which, as you know, I, I have issues with, um, but just accept leaving that aside for a minute, come down below that number. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hill, thank you, Chair, and uh, through you, the the first thing I would say is that um, again, this this insistence on this housing number um, is fair enough, but I will remind us again that thirty-seven thousand two hundred of those are already in the pipeline. And at the time the last local plan was being put together, there was assurances from the water authorities that the um, water supply was suitable for that type of growth and the proposed um, housing. Now, this new emerging plan uh, is proposing to add just 25% on top of what or as part of what we need going forward in 2041. Um, the number is smaller compared to what's already in the pipeline. But we have to show an inspector that we are putting forward a plan that meets our objectively assessed need in this area. Now, the fact that water supply is an issue is one of the issues. We have identified that from the get-go and we're saying, uh, folks, this is what the guidelines say we need as objectively assessed for this area. That doesn't change. What changes is how we can deliver that based on the resources that are available. And if we can't do that, then obviously we scale back or you, you, know, you defer it. But you have to show an inspector you've done the job properly. And we have to do the job properly. So it is a constraint, yes. It's a constraint that can be accommodated within the plan as we are proposing. Would you like to follow up? Just, yeah, just a final point. What you actually have to show the inspector is ex exceptional circumstances apply because you're proposing to depart from the standard method. The NPBF says use the standard method unless exceptional circumstances apply. So you're actually going to have to prove to an inspector that uh, exceptional Councilor circumstances Dr. apply Peter to go Williams, over. Through the chair, through the chair, please. Right, chair. The councils are going to have to prove to an inspector that circumstances exist which are exceptional to justify going above the standard method. So it's not quite as simple as been, as been suggested. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins, your response? It is, as suggested, plain. We have looked at what we, uh, what we require objectively, we've assessed it. The standard method itself, even in the government uh, paperwork, says it does not give you the housing need. You still have to look at what you need objectively and take into account various other factors. You know that. However, right, we've come up with a number. We've come up with something that says, Yes, we are looking ahead. There are constraints. We'll take care of those, we'll look at those constraints and we will act accordingly. I'm sorry, but I can't say any further than that. We have to show, we as authorities, city and South Camps, have looked at what we need. 
projected that and agreed that number, and we worked towards it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, we have numbers still to go, and I'd like to try and round up with those people. So we have Councillor Chin Johnson, followed by um, four more from the committee, I think, and two not sitting on this committee. And I'd like to take them all, and hopefully we can get through those. Councillor Chin Johnson. Hi. Um, I'd like to congratulate the uh, ambitious um, targets we've seen on the EV charging and also on self-build, and I've got a question on both. On the EV charging, will there be additional rules added on in terms of how that is implemented because there's concerns around, you know, cabling across pavements and, and things like that, so is there going to be more detail around that? And on the self-build numbers, will they apply, how will they be applied to all new building, um, new housing numbers in South Cams, or would they, for example, in North Stow, where we are having the 6,000 so houses of the 10,000 that are planned, would you have a self-build number within those 6,000 now, or does that not apply because North Stow's already um, kind of a, agreed previous plan? Councillor Dr. Stephen Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think two of us might um, respond to this. We, we, we are working currently to the policies in the current plan. And as far as I understand, we can't change that. <laughs> um, whatever new policies we bring in will start from when we adopt those policies. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a follow-up? Can Councillor Badnam. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like us to turn our attention to open space, having talked about numbers so much. Um, so I'm looking at uh, policies BGPO on page 183 and BGEO on page 185. Uh, and forgive me, I'll just read you the first line of each of them. It says, this policy will address how important open spaces are considered in the planning process. And this policy will set out how new development should provide new and enhanced open space to meet the needs it generates. So I would like us to be, um, if possible, to strengthen that and work a bit ahead of the game on that, as was done at Camborne, where when the land was originally considered for a new village at that time, the environmental assets were identified right at the outset, the lake, the hedgerow, the um, wet land area, these were identified and protected right at the outset. And in fact, what happened was that parcels of land were identified for building outside those precious areas. And so I'd like us to, if we could, and I'll leave it to you, to you officers and yourselves how to work it in, but to, to put in these policies, if these are the appropriate places to put it, an obligation or a, an undertaking to require, excuse me, <clears throat> to identify the natural resources of any site right at the outset of planning and to require that developers work around those locations and uh, particular assets and to nurture them in their build um, so that these areas can become real assets for the communities that they are part, they will become part of. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Tina Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair, and through you. Um, yes, we, we want to do that. Now, bearing in mind we have a policy of um, doubling nature, uh, the only way we can do that is to preserve what we currently have and not, um, and not let them be destroyed. And I'm sure that, um, now, I'm not sure what the exact policy wordings are that we've got now, but it's probably something that we can make sure that we do. Uh, to make sure that, you know, um, <laughs> we do keep these precious resources. And I think also, I mean, when you're talking about biodiversity net gain, let's get, we, we, what we have now is a, is a basis, is where we start from. Um, and so all I can say is, yes, we want to do that, and we will make sure that we do that. Follow-up, councillor? Thank you. Um, 
I work in agriculture and uh, I know all too well that many arable fields are pitifully low, actually, in biodiversity. It's the hedgerows and the margins that are rich, uh, and the woodlands and the copses and the streams and the ditches. These are the rich places. And that is what I would like us to identify at the outset and protect and enhance wherever we can. So however that can be, so, so simply doubling something that's a very tiny number <laughs> for the broad field area is not especially thrilling, um, but actually really identifying the things that are of worth, the ditches, the hedges, etc., cetera, um, is, is what I would like us to be doing. Thank you. Councillor Air Park, so I'm not a committee member, but on the um, Climate Environment Advisory Committee, but go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to add my support to the net zero carbon new buildings um, policy. Um, I, I listened to what was said about passive house. I think it's important, um, and I'll explain in a minute, um, why it's a fabric first approach to building of new houses. Um, so I think council needs to lead in terms of, uh, in terms of what it defines should be uh, the fabric of a new house rather than necessarily what's attainable today. Uh, because I think what we say will obviously influence how developers and educational institutions and other places, how they develop their own policies with regards um, house building, new house building. Um, the GCP recently, I recently heard, they said that the electricity demand in uh, the Greater Cambridge area is going to triple. Um, I'm not exactly sure over what period, but that will be due to three reasons. One is development, um, one is electric vehicles, and the other one is space heating. And I think that's going to be extremely challenging to and it's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built to supply that extra electricity demand. Um, so it's really important that new buildings as provide add as little um, demand to, uh, to you know for the for electricity as possible. So I'd really like to see an emphasis on fabric first within the uh, net zero carbon uh, new buildings policy as much as possible. Thank you. Councillor Dr. Tim Hawkins. I completely agree with um, uh, Councillor Bear Park. Um, at the end of the day, if new buildings actually don't use much um, in terms of what they need to uh, heat, you know, space heating, uh, that helps to reduce um, you know, what we take from the, um, from the grid. And we know that um, there's going to have to be uh, improvement in the uh, electricity infrastructure. Um, I'm not sure if um, Mr. Brinner has more to add to that, I, but yes. Uh, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Hawkins and Councillor Griffith, um, Chair. So, yes, I would agree absolutely too, and I think that the Fabric First is actually at the heart of some of the policy direction travel that we're taking with the carbon work. Um, in terms of the electricity, we are also seeking to look at the demand on new homes, but further to this particular phase of plan making, we will be doing some further work on grid capacity um, alongside some of the work that we've done previously for NEC because we are aware that's a key area as well and there is some policy of approaches towards kind of district heating teams, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that totally we understand those points of view and agree with that point of view around Fabric First rather than being, you know, looking at it at a, a, a little bit more high level. Councillor Bethpark. No, thank you very much for your comments. Um, yeah, I look forward to seeing the policy when it's drafted. Councillor Harvey. Yes, thank you, Chair. I um, had a, a, a sort of um, message from uh, Councillor Halings, uh, Paper Halings, um, which I probably would have read out if, if we uh, were now into the uh, SEAC um, meeting. But uh, as you know, she's not able to be here because of family illness. But um, she asked me on her behalf um, to thank the officers um, for their robust and radical response to the groundbreaking evidence commissioned on net zero. 
and especially the carbon cost of spatial strategy options, um, the water cycle and supply uh, work, climate adaption, green infrastructure and bio biodiversity, um, and particularly not just as add-ons uh, or projects, but as underlying considerations uh, in all decision making, and also um, for the, the um, ambition in raising building standards beyond uh, the future home standards. Um, so that was uh, just a message from Pippa Hillings. Thank you. In that case, um, I'll take my next speaker, Councillor Ellington. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I didn't think it right that if we were talking a lot about water in, we inevitably have to talk about water out. And as all these houses are going to be built in Camborne and North Stowe and all points in between, and all that water is going to end up at Utton's Drove Sewage Works, and all that water will then come in an open ditch round the outside of Swavesea, and Swavesea is considerably lower than that particular ditch. I am very concerned that the amount of water, some, I have talked to one or two um, uh, of the uh, internal drainage board people, and they say that we're talking about something like a billion gallons of water. And I fear for my village, and I'm quite sure that it is going to be another considerable problem to be sorted before you embark on some of the uh, proposed buildings. Councillor Dr. Timmy Hawkins. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think I will pass this to Mr. Dixon. Okay, John, John Dixon. So one of the studies that uh, we're undertaking is an integrated water management strategy, and that's, that's we published a significant element of that report alongside this plan, and that study will continue. Um, that study identifies that um, wastewater is a key issue that needs to be addressed through the plan. It also acknowledges uh, some of the challenges around up and strove. So what that plan will need to continue to explore with, this, with the service providers, so I should mention that Angling Water are currently undertaking a, a effectively their plan review, a, a, I forget the acronym, uh, but their, their equivalent for a plan, they're undertaking their version for wastewater. And we very much now need to take part in that process to ensure going forward we identify the right infrastructure to meet the future needs of the growth that's identified through the plan. So it's very much part of our plans to keep engaging in that process. Councillor Ellington, do you have a follow-up? No, I think it will be coming later. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dr Claire Daunton. Thank you, Chair. Um, I want to move us on to talk about um, specialist housing and homes for older people. Um, I hope this is the appropriate place. I think now we're round up and yes, you can take that question. <laughs> Good, we're getting old, we're getting tired, the meeting's getting long. Um, so it, it's really a plea um, and it's on page 278 and 279 of the local plan 298 and 299 of our agenda. Um, there's, again, a, a conflation here, I think, slightly of the two terms, specialist housing and homes for older people. Um, and I would really urge you to, to separate out the two to make it absolutely clear. So there's a sentence, the provision of some forms of specialist housing, such as general housing for older people. And there's a conflation of specialist housing for um, people with disabilities, um, people with dependency, a conflation of that term, use of the term specialist housing, with housing for older people. And we do need housing for older people. We do need whole life housing. And I'd really like to have a little bit more emphasis in the plan on the provision of whole life housing and the possibility of downsizing within developments. There's no mention of downsizing or whole life housing. 
I'll say Dr. Tina Hawkins, if you'd like to take that. Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, I, I hear Councillor Dr. Dort Donton about the uh, conflation of specialists and um, housing for those who want to downsize. I'm one of those who's been uh, banging the drum about people who want to downsize and being provided for. Um, I think our current housing strategy uh, does make allowance for um, houses to downsize to, but perhaps we can look at the policy wording um, that we're proposing um, to strengthen it as has been requested, uh, just to make sure that we are catering for those who need specialist housing uh, and those who do want to downsize, because we will all want to downsize at some point in time, I'm sure. Do you have a follow-up? Well, um, well yes, just also to, to mention the, the, the phrase whole life housing. I think that can be uh, quite a good one to use, provided it's, it's well understood, it's well explained. Do you want to follow up on that? Okay, so you're confirming it. And finally, we have Councillor Dr. Martin Khan, our final speaker, before I round up this meeting. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to... Looking about that, I very gathered about the idea about um, passive house style, but this refers to new housing. And the majority of our housing in the develop, even after all the developments, is actually going to be existing housing. Uh, uh, and uh, you talk about the improvement of uh, heritage housing, but in fact, the vast majority of housing is neither heritage housing nor, nor new housing. Uh, and we have a vast, the, the, the general way that the British people, I, I get this from my wife, who's Polish and comes in and looks at the British system and she says, you're all expanding your houses. You're not building yourself a house for, for the future. You're building yourself, you come along, you buy a little house and you build it and extend it. And that's, I look at it as true. And it's, I see it in the village um, responses to uh, all the planning applications that they receive, but the vast majority of them are extensions. Uh, now, up to now, we, we don't imply, uh, put uh, energy standards on extensions apart from the actual bit that's been built on. You won't require, you don't require a whole house. And this strikes me as an opportunity for where you have power to improve the, house, uh, the, the total housing. I don't see how you could get passive housing in many of the existing housing, but you could get zero carbon housing because uh, you know, it's always a balance if you've got a, a, a zero carbon energy supply, a renewable energy supply, between improving the, the, the amount it's used uh, and, the, uh, and the supply. Uh, uh, and so that does seem to me that there is a scope for trying to impose zero carbon housing on, on, on when you have large extensions and, uh, um, and having a policy at least to encourage that. Um, do you see that as a possibility? Could that be included in the, in the policy range? Is it possible within the planning uh, legislation that's available? Thank you, Dr. Toomey. Um, Council Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Interesting concept. Um, I think we, we have traditionally with uh, development management look at the application in front of us and determine that based on <laughs> right, uh, what is there. Now, what I don't know is if we can extend or we can create policies that will uh, force homeowners making extensions to actually retrofit, because that is what you're that's suggesting, what yeah. effectively, is retrofitting a house once they decide that they want to extend it. Now, I don't know how lawful that is, <laughs> if we can do it. I think I'm seeing shakes of head uh, to my right here. But um, perhaps Mr. Dixon can, um, can comment further. Okay, John Dixon. Uh, retrofitting obviously would be an ideal because yes, I quite agree, a lot of the challenge, as shown by our own uh, carbon evidence from November, the big challenge is existing development. But retrofitting through planning applications for new development is very, difficult, if not impossible, to implement. So, for example, the City Council, I believe, in their current plan, had a policy seeking um, what they call consequential improvements. Mm -hmm. But it's very difficult to secure with the planning system. So, I think retrofitting the existing properties is a challenge, perhaps, for the, the wider roles of council and government, rather than mm -hmm. something you can necessarily secure through applications for new development. I think that that's, that's a difficult truth. And finally, a follow-up? No, sorry, uh, Ms. Oh, apologies. Paul Craner. Just a very
very brief follow-up to that, and as Mr. Dixon's identified, planning, through planning policy, it's very difficult. There are other obvious other areas to explore, and building regulations obviously is a key area for some of this stuff to be able to be um, looked at a bit more holistically. You know, planning policy can do so much through development management, but there are other areas that we, we should be pushing corporately as councils as well for that to make a difference. Sorry, follow up? Okay. Uh, sorry, no, that's it. That's okay. okay, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for your contributions um, to the officers for your many, many hours of work and for your answers so far and um, for the many, many hours of work in the months and years ahead. Um, I will try to sum up what we have got there on the environmental impact and also on the infrastructure. And then I will call upon Ian Senior when we go to the recommendations to encapsulate what's been said throughout this meeting. Okay, firstly, a number of councillors commended the net zero carbon um, new building policy and wanted loopholes to be avoided and asking for that to be tightened up as, it, as best it can. And following on from that, we had questions from Councillor Hunt also about carbon neutrality and gas pipeline or natural gas, biogas, and maybe don't assume that that's going to be you know, banned is the, is the best word I can think of um, to use um, fossil fuel gas and what can we actually push for and make sure is in the policies um, going forward. Then comments about flooding and water management and also water supply. The flooding to make sure that we get as much resilience as we possibly can, bearing in mind that also the flood authority is not ourselves but we have that slight conflict possibly, but to really try and make sure that places are not built which flood um, downstream elsewhere. Or it's, um, I think um, Castle Brandon put this much better than me, but displaced flooding, kind of. Okay, then also water supply, the constraints on numbers, which is obviously a real concern. And that has been um, illustrated, I think, in the documentation that we've received. But many councillors were pushing for that to be as kind of dealt with as much as we possibly can. And any licenses to do, do with that. And we had also buildings with the reuse of existing ones, points made by Councillor Cathcart. Then we moved on to footpaths and cycle paths and how we interconnect between villages and also conservation listed buildings and the improvement in the quality of high streets. Um, in response to some of this, um, Councillor Hawkins did point out the water supply uses of commercial businesses, agricultural, isn't just housing, so we have to look at the broader picture. But I think all the councillors, members of this committee, were probably the top concern was how we build these homes with the water supply. And then Councillor Dr. Richard Williams was illustrating the point that medium growth and the evidence and also that water supply is a problem and what the constraints are and can we examine that. And there's obviously a conflict, potential conflict between the, the two. Um, Councillor Van der Weyer talked about the acceleration of housing and the problems with the risk of challenge um, and how we can really try and make this as robust as possible. And then on a different topic, um, EV charging, self-builds, and can we set ambitious targets? And then moving on to open space um, or, and doubling nature, but actually the doubling nature is we need to look at what we really want to um, preserve, like the hedgerows, the margins, the copses, the streams, and thinking about where the biodiversity really lies. There's more biodiversity in those hedgerows than in an agricultural field. So the terminology we use and what we actually mean. Um, and finally, I'd like to pick up on 
on because ultimately the electricity grid and the three times more supply will be needed and how do we marry these two things up I think that came across very strongly um, and then the point of sewage the water that comes in and the water that goes out and the fear of where that will land up and if there is not a strategy and a point to be sort of taken forward in the process of how can we ensure that that kind of thing does not happen and specialist housing and whole life housing and trying to firm up that as giving people options to downsize and also to look ahead not just the next five years ten years of their lives but something which will um, really provide opportunity into the future and the final comment which seems like it's going to be difficult but can we retrofit existing housing can we make that like an imposition I think and make it something in the policy which is certainly one to be thinking about um, at this point before we move to recommendations which are on page four of your agenda papers I'd just like to bring in Ian Senior um, at the ready. Okay, if everybody could turn, to, if you have your papers in front of you, the recommendations are listed on page four, um, four A down to G, and as read as they're in your papers. And Ian Senior, can I ask you to summarise the the extra points that we want to recommend to Cabinet based on our discussion, the, our debate this evening. I thought you would. <laughs> Um, thank you for your time this evening. Okay, um, committee, because this is very long, very complicated, I trust that is okay. Maybe I should check with um rory mckenna that we are okay to go with the recommendation as written with follow-up extra points coming shortly uh, yeah yeah given uh, the length of the meeting uh, it's probably not as as welcome uh, i think i'm going to try to make the recommendation to be made uh, in derogatory to um indeed thank you So I move these recommendations, um, hopefully by affirmation, to um, the cabinet for next week's meeting. Can I do this by affirmation? Chair, I'm going to okay. abstain. Okay. Um, so one abstention from Councillor Dr. Richard Williams. If that could be noted, um, Mr. Senior. Okay. I now bring this meeting to a close. Oh, apologies, Councillor Cathcart. No, just I'd like to uh, think that, um, I mean, this is a very important <coughs> a set of policies, and they're highly enlightened uh, and actually quite radical, as has already been pointed out. But in fact, they're highly important, as I said, uh, and it could well shape this history for many years to come in a way which was beneficial to everyone. So I think we look forward to these policies being implemented because they're probably amongst the most enlightened and possibly radical in the country, I don't know for a fact. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to echo what you've just said, Councillor Cathcart, and just thanks for so much work and some really, in my opinion, ambitious, forward-thinking policies, um, since I haven't spoken as myself. <laughs> oh, Councillor Badnam. 
in anticipation of you shortly closing the meeting, I just wanted to say thank you very much for chairing what's also been a very complicated meeting um, so well. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And that bring this meeting to a close. May I remind those members who are also members of the Climate and Environment Advisory Committee to remain in the chamber. I'm not actually sure. I'm sure we will have information on that. Um, those wishing to join SEAT remotely will need to leave this meeting and join the SEAT meeting. Members of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee, just before you leave, please, may I remind you that the next scheduled Scrutiny and Overview Committee meeting is on Thursday, the 14th of October. Thank you and good night. I wanted to say good evening, but it probably is good night. <laughs> Thank you.